Uh, does anyone have any questions from last time? What did you talk about last time? We finished up neurology, right? Okay, sorry, I, I forgot to post up the video. I made the video, but then I forgot to upload it to YouTube, so I was a little late on that one, but that's up now, so you have access to that. Um, okay, well, let's learn how to turn that frown upside down. Let's talk about behavioral stuff. Have you guys covered uh, any kind of psych stuff yet? To the end of the semester, really? Because uh, I was doing it based off of the schedule that I got from. Oh, they changed it again? Right, I changed it based on that. That's why we had like chemo first and everything. But. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe there's other changes I was not privy to, which is very, very possible. The number of things that happened that I don't know about are numerous, not only here, but elsewhere in my life, especially at my house. <laughs> Anywho, we'll talk about it now, so that way by the time, yeah, exactly, by the time you get to it, you guys will be experts on the drugs at least, so know exactly how to treat, exactly. Um, after this class, some you may need to be on some of these medications, so that works out perfect too, you'll know exactly which one you want, you can ask your, your doc for it. So let's talk about let's talk about depression. Um, so depression and anxiety is a huge, huge issue. A lot of people, you know, it's, uh, behavioral health uh, has had a lot of stigma against it for a good long time, uh, or stigma, I should say. And, and so it took um, you know time for people to become more comfortable with it to be able to talk about it uh, more frankly. And I think it's really it's a really good movement here. So we're seeing more people that are um, having this. You know, 10 to 15 percent of the population at some time probably has some degree of depression or anxiety. I'm sure. Um, you know. Who has anxiety right now about something in their life? The yeah, problem is everyone, right? So it's one of those things where um, you know it's 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 something that may be situational, could be short, uh, self-limited, or it could be much more of a kind of long-term issue. And so we'll look at how we can treat those both in the acute manner and then also kind of more chronic, uh, more chronically. We've had drugs for this since around the 1950s, but they are um, usually were a lot more toxic, not nearly as effective. And you would also see that. Um, it was really relegated towards, you know, being used by like psychiatrists and, and, and whatnot. But nowadays, it's starting to be moved more towards primary care. So a lot of you uh, will be expected to treat these patients and start them up on a, a you know, a depression regimen and things like that, or manage your anxiety. And so you really need to make sure you're, you're kind of treating both because they go kind of hand in hand. So someone could be depressed because of all the anxiety they're having or vice versa. And so it's important to kind of manage uh, both of those. Um, it's really difficult to determine. Yeah, you know, some people be like, oh, those pills don't actually work. Hard to say because, again, there's a lot of placebo effect that comes about from these. So just the, the act of taking something and thinking you're doing something positive to treat your, your mental illness like could um, be enough to have a powerful stimulus to think, okay, well, now I'm getting better, right? So there's some degree of placebo effect there. Uh, a lot of trials didn't have very good outcomes really defined. So uh, there's some questionable efficacy. But uh, in general, this is going to be our gold standard of treatment, as we'll see with some of the medications we're going to talk about. So um, there's a lot of secondary conditions that can lead to depression, anxiety, like hypothyroidism, Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's important to go through and try to um, treat those first, try, try, try to treat the baseline issue. And then once you correct that, hopefully that'll fix a lot of the other uh, you know, kind of ancillary mental health issues that go along with that. And there's a lot of several medications that can fix this as well. So like isotretinoin can have some effects on mood. Uh, I mentioned uh, levetiracetam or Keppra can have, you know, you see increased aggression in children that can cause some mood uh, changes. Certainly a lot of cardiovascular agents like beta blockers, hormonal therapy. So all these things can have effects on a on, uh, person's well-being and their mental status. Uh, so it's important to look at those as well. Do a good medication history to see if anything could be contributory from that standpoint. And obviously the big thing we're trying to treat, we're trying to prevent when someone has depression is kind of the end goal for some of those patients. Yeah, suicide, so self-harm, suicide. We saw a lot of that um, in my fellowship because again, that was one of the main reasons why we see people in the ER because they were trying to harm themselves during their life. Um, and so that's the thing we're trying to hold off again. So we'll look at some issues that come about from that. Because you'll see with some of these medications, like one of the side effects is possible increased risk of suicidality. And you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like we're using it to prevent them from doing that, but also they're going to try to commit suicide. Like we'll look at why that is and, and some reasons for that. So anxiety, um, you can have several different kind of ways to classify it. There's kind of a generalized anxiety disorder, but there's other things like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Uh, I was actually so you know, uh, I was diagnosed with OCD one time. It was so bad, it was uh, diagnosed as CDO. So, oh my gosh. just kidding. Um, 
certain things like post-traumatic stress disorder, phobias, all of that can kind of be lumped together as kind of generalized anxiety sort of conditions. And so typically these are, uh, therapies are going to be initiated. The symptoms are really interfering with our life. It's okay to experience some degree of anxiety. It's kind of a normal defense mechanism uh, for us to survive as a species. We need anxiety, but it should be kind of self-limited. It really shouldn't interrupt our normal daily activities. And once, once that's happening, that's where therapy is going to be um, initiated there. And again, oftentimes associated with depression, right? People can have one or the other. One may be more predominant than the other, but they typically go hand in hand in a lot of cases. So why do people get depressed? What's the, the biochemical you know, basis for this? We don't really know. Um, some people think it has to do with the levels of catecholamines that are in the CNS, so things like serotonin, which will um, abbreviate 5-HT, norepinephrine, and then dopamine. Um, you know, in some cases, if you had drugs that were actually depleting monoamines in the brain, so there's an old, old drug we used to use for blood pressure called reserpine, we don't use anymore. But you would see that it would actually deplete monoamines in the, in the CNS. You'd get rid of all your norepinephrine and dopamine. And they found that, you know, that led to a lot of depression in those patients. So they, that's kind of where they made this association. And we're thinking that this is probably why people are becoming depressed. Um, now, some of the drugs that we'll see being used for depression they can correct that issue pretty quickly because we'll see a lot of them are geared towards increasing levels of serotonin or increasing levels of norepinephrine right there at the synapse. So if you fix that, you would think that the depression would be gone, but that's not really the case because one of the big things and the big caveats here is that when you're treating someone for depression, it takes weeks for these drugs to kick in, four to six weeks before you really see full efficacy. And that's an important thing to remember because again, if you have someone who's depressed and they start taking medication, they don't know that they have to wait four to six weeks before it really to start working, then they're going to think it's not working too early, and then that can lead to them discontinuing too early, right? Something we want to avoid. So um, there's probably some downstream effects. There's probably some changes going on, the receptor occupancy, gene transcription factors, et cetera. We don't really know. Um, no final theory as of now, but that's something that ongoing research will hopefully elucidate one day. But our goals here, we want to reduce symptoms of acute depression. I'm going to help hopefully get them to a normal level of functioning and then prevent any kind of further episodes for depression. So just like, um, you know, cases of autoimmune conditions like, you know, uh, MS or rheumatoid arthritis, you go through periods of, you know, exacerbations and kind of uh, uh, and go back down to kind of baseline levels of, you know, disease. And so it's important to be able to manage those flare-ups and then have that kind of chronic management there as well. So we'll see some different therapies that are geared towards that. So... As I mentioned, three main phases of treatment. There's kind of this acute phase. So hopefully we're going to have remission of symptoms, kind of deal with the acute issues. A lot of times patients, you know, may be suicidal when this happens, right? This may be the thing that kind of tips us over or they'll be presenting to you saying, hey, I'm having this, you know, I'm just feeling kind of worthless and I don't want to get out of bed and don't have energy and I don't like anything anymore, et cetera. That's that acute phase. We want to try to get immediate remission of symptoms there. And then uh, continuation phase, maybe four to nine months, we're hopefully getting rid of, you know, residual symptoms. They're kind of getting used to the medication, hopefully have, you know, uh, limited side effects. We'll see there. And then really the maintenance phase. And, and some patients were, are going to require lifetime therapy. That's just kind of um, the cards that may have been dealt. Um, some people, if it's especially more situational, so if it was like a death in the family or something like that, it may be only a short, uh, short term kind of thing. Just depends on the patient, and you'll be evaluating that on a case by case basis. But adherence is super critical. If they don't um, stick with their medications like they're supposed to, um, that can be a big thing um, where you know, the drugs aren't going to work if you're not taking them. And then the education is going to be a critical component here as well. So um, obviously, as far as non-pharmacologic therapy, psychotherapy is going to be huge. You typically will see that these are going to be additive uh, benefits here. So psychotherapy, along with medications, work better than either one by themselves. And so I'm a strong proponent for getting therapy, just talking to someone, even you know, someone who's a non-partial person in your life um, can be a big help for a lot of people, just kind of air out a lot of grievances and, and, and kind of talk about things. But there's other things like electroconvulsive therapy um, has been used back in the day, probably not quite so often anymore. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, it's like kind of shock treatment. So again, I've not done too many studies into this kind of a I think it was kind of a barbaric sort of treatment there, but it's sometimes still used for more kind of treatment resistant cases of depression. And has anyone ever heard of this uh, RTMS is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation? Um, it's kind of interesting. My, uh, I, I didn't know much about it, but I actually had a friend who's a paramedic who got a job working as a tech for one of these offices that does this. Uh, does this, and basically they use this, uh, these magnets. Uh, there's studies to, to back it up. These magnets uh, that project uh, these waves through the brain, uh, and they'll go for treatments, you know, every so often for a certain, you know, defined course. Uh, and they do see some some decent effects on on depression and, and having alleviation of the symptoms. Even people who have schizophrenia and things like that do see some improvement. So there's different modalities out there, and if you work in this field, you'll become much more familiar with those. But again, we're going to focus on the drugs. So.
we have um, a difficult time determining who's going to really respond to which agent. So again, 30 to 40% of people just respond to placebo alone. You know, so do not discount the placebo effect. It can be very powerful. And this is why we have to do things like randomized controlled trials to make sure we can elucidate how much of that is placebo effect and versus how much the actual drug is working itself, right? So typically, um, there's no one gold standard drug you're going to go to for every single patient. It's going to be different based on your patient. So looking at things like uh, if they've been on treatment before, what was their history of response? You know, a lot of times you're not necessarily switching drugs based on lack of efficacy, but it's usually going to be more on the side effect profile, right? And so we'll see there's a lot of side effects associated with these drugs. Um, you're going to look at concurrent medical illnesses, presenting symptoms, the cost can be a big uh, feature here. And then drug-drug interactions, which we'll talk about, uh, adverse reaction profiles, and then uh, the patient preference. So again, that needs to be something that they're buying into as well, because they're not really committed to being adherent to this, and the, the therapy is going to fail regardless, right? So how we um, classify our drugs are either going to be based on their chemical structure. So we'll talk about a few of those in just a little bit. And then also their presumed mechanism of action. So that'll be more clear when we talk about the different classes here. Um, you'll find that just because a drug has a specific mechanism in this category does not mean that that's how specifically it's going to work to fix depression. Because again, we don't know what's actually changing to actually fix this depression, but um, it's still the, the best thought we have. We know these drugs are effective, so we just classify them based on their mechanisms. We'll see that in a second. Um, but it also helps us to determine their side effects. So if we know the, the mechanism of the drug, we know what it's doing to those catecholamines in the brain, we can also kind of get a good idea for what type of side effects we're going to see with those. So kind of keep that in mind. So as I mentioned, two to six weeks uh, of therapy to get really full therapeutic effects. They'll probably even say it's probably more like four to six weeks to really see full efficacy there, but let them know it's going to take time, a few weeks, uh, before they really kind of kick in there. Um, however, those are the beneficial effects. The adverse effects can happen immediately, right? They can happen within hours of taking the medication. So again, if you're depressed and you're not really, you know, you, you want to do something, you want to help yourself, but then the medications you're taking just make you feel like crap and you don't actually feel any better, you know, that could be a reason for non-compliance. It's really important to try to pick something to minimize the side effects and, and, and educate them on what they might experience. So they need to go ahead and stick through it if they can't, they're, they're having it. And so some people will have just an intrinsic failure to antidepressants. You know, some of this may be due to things like pharmacogenetic differences. So this is why switching between um, different classes of antidepressants may be useful because they may be more you know, uh, more susceptible to one versus another. Um, could be inadequate uh, drug dosage. So if you don't optimize your dose appropriately or treat for long enough, that could be one issue. And then the non-compliance, again, is, is a big uh, problem there as well. So um, again, some people just kind of have natural remission of symptoms anyway within six to 12 months. So again, sometimes it's hard to tell, was it the actual medication that helped the patient get better or is it themselves that got better kind of on their own? But um, a lot of those patients will also have recurrence. So yeah, we want remission of symptoms, but we also want to prevent further relapses of those symptoms as well. So again, that's where the medications can be useful from that standpoint. Um, and so some of the classes we'll talk about, you know, like especially like the tricyclic antidepressants. Have you guys heard that term before? I mentioned a few times. So TCAs are kind of an older uh, class of drugs we have for the, and then SSRIs. Anyone know what that stands for? Yes, yeah, selective like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, right? So again, you know the mechanism from that one just based off the name there. This one is more named based off the structure. So we'll look at those tricyclic in their presence a little bit later. Um, so again, they typically don't differ a lot in efficacy necessarily. Again, some people respond better to one versus another, but you're going to find that um, the adverse effects are going to be very, very different between these classes of drugs. And that's one of the important things to note there, right? So be able to kind of anticipate what adverse effects you might see uh, in these patients and, and be able to educate on that appropriately, right? So especially at therapeutic doses, all certain side effects, and then also an overdose um, can be a big issue. Because one of the things we see is that when someone starts these uh, medications for depression, they do have that increased risk of suicidality. And you might think, okay, why is that? Um, so usually a person who has depression, how, what are their energy levels like? Pretty low, right? They're, pretty, they're laying in bed. You think about, you're not really, you know, enjoying the things they used to. They're really not getting around. So even if they did have thoughts of harming themselves, they may not have the energy to really act on them, right? So it's like, well, I'd be, you know, the world would be better off without me, but I just don't feel like doing anything about it, right? That could be a situation you run into. When they start taking these medications, all of a sudden this could alleviate parts of that where they actually have more energy. Now they have the energy to actually act on those thoughts of self-harm. That's why you end up seeing that. At least that's the proposed theory on why that is. And so um, that's very important that the medications we're giving them are not super dangerous. So TCAs, and the older drugs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors we'll look at, um, those are super dangerous in overdose. And in fact, um, you know, they could see, you know, especially back in like the 80s and the early 90s before the SSRIs came along, um, you would have ERs, you'd have several beds dedicated just to people who had overdosed on TCAs, right? 
they were the only effective drugs you had at the time, though, and so it's kind of, uh, you know, this double-edged sword you had to deal with. Nowadays, we have a lot of safer drugs, like the SSRI tend to be much, much safer. In overdose, you could take 10 times your normal dose of an SSRI and not see a, a big deal. 10 times a dose of a TCA it could be potentially deadly, right? So that's one of the big things why we're shunting towards these newer drugs, because their side effect profiles are such better, or so much better. So... Um, the main categories we're going to run into, we have our monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs. Where did we talk about this before? What other disease state? It's like two lectures ago, or last lecture. Parkinson's, right? There are Parkinson's. We talked about monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. These are going to be non-selective monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are going to be working by blocking that breakdown of catecholines like uh, serotonin and norepinephrine, okay? So by decreasing that breakdown, because you're inhibiting that enzyme, those levels are going to rise. You're going to have more those catecholamines in the synapse. And again, that's what we originally thought is how you fix depression is by increasing those levels because we were thinking depressed people just didn't have enough of that, right? Um, again, not the full story, but that's how we thought they worked. And this, you know, we'll have some efficacy here. After that, and there's going to be lots of problems we'll see with these drugs in a little bit, we had the tricyclic antidepressants. Again, that name is based off of their chemical structure. They were working to re, uh, inhibit the reuptake of 5-HT and also norepinephrine. So instead of... Um, preventing their breakdown, they basically prevented that recycling mechanism where they went through a transporter into that presynaptic neuron. So that was one way we could do it. They have a lot of side effects, though, because they have lots of different mechanisms. So they have, like, we'll talk about them, but they have, like, a lot of anticholinergic properties. Um, you know, they block sodium channels so that can affect the, um, you know, uh, conduction of electricity in the heart. So you saw a lot of conduction uh, abnormalities and everything. So these are very, very kind of dangerous drugs to overdose on. We still see this occasionally because we'll look at some other ancillary uses for TCAs. Um, but these can be very dangerous, uh, in, especially in overdose. So these are not ideal. But then we had the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And this is more specifically just working on blocking reuptake of serotonin. You increase those serotonin levels within the, uh, the synapse. And then you see alleviation of depression after that, you know, say two to six weeks. Um, so again, very, very specific and only blocking reuptake of serotonin. And then secondary to that, we had a further generation of uh, agents where we had the selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs. And so we're going to see some different uses for these. Um, but these are going to, as the name might imply, they're going to block reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So a little bit um, less specific mechanism, and we'll look at some uses for those as we go along. But typically, your gold standard for most patients is going to be the SSRIs. These are going to be your kind of go-to drugs you're going to use for the majority of these patients, okay? And typically, the older agents have a lot more side effects. Newer ones, typically more selective, fewer side effects. And so, yes? So Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're looking at the, and so this actually, this picture kind of shows uh, uh, some of this as well. So one of the things you're going to find is that TCAs, while their main therapeutic effect is by blocking reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, they also have a host of other things they're going to do. So if you look here, like a TCA, they're blocking alpha adrenergic receptors. If you block alpha receptors, say like on the blood vessels, what happens there? Vasodilation, right? So you can see hypotension associated with that, right? You can have a lot of anti-muscarinic activity due to this as well. What does uh, anti-muscarinic activity on the heart do? Speed it up or slow it down? Anticholinergic, like atropine on the heart. No, Speeds it up, right? You're right. So again, think, uh, uh, you know, you have atropine that's blocking acetylcholine of the muscarinic receptors, heart rate goes up. So they get tachycardic, they get hypotensive, uh, they're blocking sodium channels in the heart, so that way you can see conduction disturbances. So they can go into arrhythmia and go into this kind of uh, overwhelming metabolic acidosis, because when you're hypotensive and you're not perfusing the body correctly, you get very acidotic. Very, very dangerous. They, uh, people tend to um, uh, crumb very easily with these medications. Crump is our term for when they kind of go off the deep end a little bit, and they're they're kind of gone at that point. Um, so anyway, so uh, in comparison to that, the SNRIs, they only block reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. They don't have a lot of the ancillary kind of effects. And we'll look at that a little bit later when we talk about them. But if you're looking here, say, uh, for instance, we have a serotonergic neuron, we have a noradrenergic neuron, right? So this one's releasing serotonin, this one's releasing norepinephrine. Um, these are those transporters, those reuptake transporters that are uh, useful for recycling those uh, neurotransmitters. So instead of just letting them get metabolized, we like to be a little bit more efficient than that. And so we'll recycle them for further release later on. So this is where SSRIs, um, TCAs, and SNRIs are going to work to block those reuptake, right? 
Um, we'll also see that the monamine oxidase inhibitors are going to be working specifically on these enzymes that will are responsible for metabolism, and so they'll actually block that. And so we're going to see lots of dietary interactions, just like we'll, um, we mentioned with the like um, selegiline, like we did for Parkinson's. We'll look at some issues with that with tyramine-containing foods in just a little bit. But um, just think about this as far as our mechanisms go. Just know that the SSRIs are going to be the most specific ones because they're only blocking our take of serotonin. SNRIs are going to be a little less specific. TCA is definitely a lot less specific than monamine oxidase inhibitors. You know? So again, we're getting better, safer drugs typically as we go along, and now the SSRIs and SNRIs are our go-to drugs. Okay. So in general, we're trying to enhance serotonin, uh, serotonin activity here. You know, we don't know the full mechanism. Again, I'm not going to go super in depth on the uh, on the downstream effects because then we just don't know. But there's lots of different proposed theories. Just know that what the actual mechanism of the drug is, and just know that somehow that equals uh, uh, fixing depression, right? Has anyone ever seen the underwear gnomes on um, uh, the underpants gnomes on South Park? I guess must not watch a lot of South Park. They talk about their plans for world domination. They're basically like, step one, we do this. Step two. They don't say anything. And then step three, profits. And so this is kind of that situation where step one, we give these drugs. Step two, step three, you fix your depression, right? So we don't really know. So just know what the mechanism of the actual drugs themselves are. Go watch that episode. It's very funny. Anyway, um, so we had the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. We mentioned these are going to be the first generation antidepressants we have. And these are very nonspecific. So they work on both monoamine oxidase A and B, as opposed to when you go back to Parkinson's, we have those monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, right? So again, these are less selective. They're going to be working on blocking uh, uh, metabolism, both serotonin and norepinephrine. And so the three main ones we have here is called phenylzine, isocarboxazine, and this tranylcypramine. Again, we do not use these too, too commonly. In fact, I don't know that I've seen a patient on these, at least since I've been practicing. But it's important to know because you may see them used occasionally, at least be aware of, of those drugs. At least you know you can look it up when you see monoamine oxidase inhibitor. You're like, oh, yeah, I know what that is, right? Um, so these are irreversible inhibitors, and typically... When you have an irreversible inhibitor, what does that do to the duration of action of a drug versus it being reversible? Longer or shorter? A lot longer, right? So as long as that enzyme is around, it's being irreversibly inhibited, you have to make new enzyme in order to uh, kind of get back to baseline. So that's one of the big problems you ran into, because even if you took someone off of these drugs, guess what? The effects still stuck around for a while because they were irreversibly in, uh, uh, binding those enzymes, which could be okay in some cases. If you think about a non-compliant patient, um, you're going to find that that may be okay. If they miss a few doses, they still have that effect around for a while. Maybe that's a good thing, but in a lot of the cases, it's not going to be great because, again, if, you, if they're having an issue with the drug, they're having uh, untoward side effects, and you try to take them off of it, they're not going to clear up immediately. So that's one of the things to remember with that one, right? Um, they also affect uh, metabolism of dopamine, so you see a little bit more dopamine um, being uh, sticking around. And if you have increased intake of tyramine, which we mentioned is a precursor to a lot of these catecholamines, you're going to find that if you're increasing the, the uptake the precursor and you're blocking the metabolism you're going to get a whole lot more of those catecholamines and that's where you see a lot of the side effects and one of the big things we're going to talk about as far as antidepressants go i don't know if you've heard of it or not is serotonin syndrome probably mentioned it briefly but you guys heard of that before mm -hmm. this is where we're going to see a lot of these drugs that have serotonergic activity this is where you see serotonin syndrome <laughs> come from okay so anyway this leads to a lot of food drug interactions and this is one of the main reasons why we don't use this anymore you remember any of the foods we mentioned that are high in tyramine aged cheese aged cheeses Aged meats. Anything else? Yeah, I mentioned the aged cheeses. Yeah, it's not like your craft singles, but like you know the really kind of bougie kind of cheese. What? Like the bougie kind of cheeses. Yeah, like stuff you gotta get from like like uh, Fresh Market or something, not stuff like you're gonna get from like Walmart, right? Um, I'm not denigrating Walmart. I shop there as exclusively. Um, <laughs> Uh, also, think about like red wine. Also has a lot of tyramine in it, uh, fava beans. So again, you can go back at that list and kind of look to see all the uh, all the foods that tend to have a high amount of that. And so those are foods that these patients would want to uh, avoid typically, right? So anyway, so I mentioned these are the uh, three uh, main ones you're running to: phenylzine, tranylcypramine, uh, and then that selegiline, which you mentioned is mainly used for Parkinson's. Again, that one's more specific as a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. Um, so adverse effects you're going to see. So if you're monkeying around with norepinephrine, one of the problems you run into is you have issues regulating uh, postural uh, blood pressure. And so you get postural hypotension can be very common. And again, if you're dealing with an older patient who already has issues with this to begin with, more likely to see what? Orthostatic hypotension, blood pressure drops as you stand up, you get dizzy, and you 
fault, right? So forests are a big deal with that. Um, you see some weight gain associated with that, which again, depending on what their uh, reason for depression was in the first place, this may not make it any better uh, in those uh, certain cases. And then one of the big things you're going to run into with a lot of these antidepressants is the sexual side effects. So decreased libido, anorgasmia are very common with a lot of these. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of people switch over to different agents. We'll talk about which one specifically is kind of the least likely cause sexual side effects, but this is a big reason why people switch off to different drugs because, uh, you know, if, again, if you're, you know, depressed and you're in a, you know, at least a decent relationship or in a relationship and all of a sudden you can't have sex anymore, that may worsen your depression, right? So that's a big reason why people may switch off to this stuff. Um, and the other thing you worry about, and this is going to be more seen when you have a lot of tyramine coming in or you're mixing other drugs that may inhibit the, you know, the breakdown or the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, is this hypertensive crisis. So, because again, you're seeing more norepinephrine circulating around that is acting on those alpha receptors in the blood vessels, you're seeing vasoconstriction, thus hypertension, right? So you can see headache, nausea, vomiting, stiff neck, like all those things that kind of go along with that kind of hypertensive crisis. And so it's one of those things that could, uh, you know, produce an MI, uh, ischemia. So you need to treat that. It's kind of a medical emergency to watch out for that. Um, and again, may occur after the drug has even been discontinued because it takes about two weeks to regenerate those enzymes. So again, think about that. The fact that these irreversible inhibitors, the drug effects are going to stick around for a while, right? You can typically treat antihypertensives, um, use a lot of IV agents. So think about like levetalol, think about like nitroprusside, think about nitroglycerin, things like that. You can go back to look at our um, uh, hypertension lecture and you'll see some drugs we can use to treat that. And so I mentioned the uh, HGs, sour cream, yogurt, um, MSG uh, has a decent amount of tyramine in it, soy sauce. Again, you know, no, no Asian food, unfortunately, sauerkraut and no German food. Uh, and coffee has some, you know, it's like you're just knocking out country after country. It's no good, right? So, um, Again, a good reason why we don't use these drugs anymore because they have a lot of interactions, right? But again, if you had someone who failed therapy after therapy, like this might be something they might try. So you may see it uh, used occasionally. Um, other medications which can have interactions here. So you think about amphetamines. We haven't talked about these too much, but we'll get to them when we get to ADHD at the end of this section. But uh, a lot of the amphetamines, they block reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine and things like that. And so again, as you might imagine, this can have an interaction here. So you can see uh, hypertensive crises associated with that. Um, a lot of appetite suppressants are also stimulants, similar to amphetamines. Um, cocaine can be a big one. Decongestion like pseudoephedrine. So anything that are affecting those neurotransmitters, those catecholamines, can interact with this. And you can see this in kind of synergy here, right? So you'd expect to see hypertension, tachycardia, uh, and that can be, you know, definitely a medical emergency. Cerebrovascular accidents could occur. All kinds of bad stuff, right? That makes sense. So moving on from that, then we have the TCAs. And again, these are going to be a little bit safer uh, in some regards. But again, I've seen quite a few bad TCA cases. And so you'll still see these drugs being used um, with some regularity because there's a lot of uses you'll see just uh, other than just depression. Anyone know where you might see a TCA being used like uh, amitriptyline? Migraines. Yeah, so uh, potential uh, as a like preventative for migraines in some cases. We you wouldn't use it for seizures necessarily. This actually has GABA uh, antagonism. So you actually can cause seizures and overdose. That's another big thing we have to worry about. Anyone, no one else, you might see it. Neuropathic pain is another one you might see it used for occasionally. So uh, like fibromyalgia, diabetic neuropathies, these might ha uh, have some benefit there. We'll talk more about that in the pain section, I think in ortho later on. Um, even uh, some of the TCAs, one of them is because of their anticholinergic actions, what do you think that does to secretions? You get more copious secretions or does it dry them up? Dry them up, right? What do you think it does to urine uh, retention? Go up or should you wet your, uh, wet your pants? You're holding on to fluids, right? Because you just said you're going to dry out. So you're going to hold on. You have your urinary retention. Uh, some of these are actually used for bedwetting. So uh, if you have a kid who is wetting the bed pretty chronically, you can actually administer this. Not only that, but the drug is sedating. So that helps them to sleep a little better. They hold on to more urine and they wake up and hopefully haven't wet through, through their, their uh, pajamas, right? So that can be a very beneficial thing. So you'll find some other uses. The other thing... These drugs are very sedating due to their anticholinergic activity. And so for a while, a lot of mid-level practitioners in Florida, because we are kind of one of the last states to really allow mid-levels to prescribe controlled substances, right? Um, you needed something to prescribe for sleep. And so a lot of the controlled substances or agents used for sleep are controlled substances. So that was kind of, you're precluded from using that. And so they would prescribe things like TCAs. Or we'll look at some other ones a little bit later. And so that was one, uh, another reason why you might see these being used. So uh, that might be changing a little bit nowadays since you guys will be able to get your own DEAs and prescribe these or if you have your attending sign off on, on controlled scripts and things like that. But um, just something to consider. There's a lot of other uses. You'll still see patients on these with some regularity. Okay. Um, so again, these are going to be blocking, uh, for depression at least, they're blocking those uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uh, reuptake transporters. So you see increased levels in the synapse. 
So that's their proposed mechanism. Um, and they used to be first line. Used to, that used to be the best agents we had, but they got supplanted by the SSRIs. So we'll mention them briefly here just because you will see them with, with some regularity. Um, but I mentioned pain conditions, specifically neuropathic pain, and sometimes for insomnia because, again, it's very sedating that sort of drug. So we have several agents here. Probably the most common ones you're going to run into include amitriptyline. Uh, you'll see doxepin. You'll see nortriptyline pretty commonly. But there are some other ones here as well, so like uh, clomipramine, amoxapine, um, disipramine, uh, imipramine. So again, these are all ones uh, you may run into. Amitriptyline is probably the most kind of like the poster child, I would say, of the, the TCAs. is one you're going to probably see the most commonly. So as I mentioned, they affect many different types of receptors, so the anticholinergic effects. So remember the mnemonic for that, so it matters a hatter, so you can actually, these are not good for elderly patients because you have, you know, altered mental status, which is no good for them. Um, you have, what do you think it would do to your eyes as far as pupil constriction? Dilation or constriction? So anticholinergic, think my dryasis, right? So I get blind as a bath, they're not able to accommodate correctly. Um, so think about that. They get hot as a hair, so they can get very flush. You can see hyperthermia, they get dry. Uh, tachycardia. So remember the anticholinergic effects. So that informs a lot of the side effects you're going to run into with these medications. And then I mentioned that cardiac conduction delay. So this is oftentimes will end up um, causing these patients' demise when they overdose on these is the fact they will block sodium channels. And we already saw one in our arrhythmia lecture that will increase, uh, that will uh, space out your QRS interval. And you can actually see uh, pretty significant ventricular arrhythmias developed there. And so that can be uh, pretty, pretty bad. And actually, what, one of the actual things we do to diagnose or to determine how big of a TCA effect someone has on board, we'll actually measure their EKG and look at the QRS interval. And based on how wide that gets, based on that sodium channel blockade, we know just how much drug is on board and we can guess how likely they are to have arrhythmias or seizures and things like that. We have studies that kind of back that up. So it's kind of a neat thing we can do um, where we'll look at the EKG and be like, okay, it's greater than 100. Now we know they have enough on board. They're more likely to have a seizure. Now it's greater than 120. Now we know they're more likely to have an arrhythmia. So that's one of the things we can use uh, diagnostically to kind of uh, gauge someone's overdose and see how severe it's going to get. It will block alpha receptors, so hypotension can be a big one. So you can see some postural hypotension, which again is not good for elderly patients. Uh, sexual dysfunction can be somewhat common, weight gain, and then we mentioned antihistamine sort of effects. So think about this like a first generation antihistamine uh, kind of activities here. So it will have a lot of sedation associated with it while we use it for sleep sometimes. Um, and again, someone needs to have a normal productive active life, like you know, this this could be inhibiting that, right? They're very groggy and they're kind of going through the day in kind of a haze. So um, those are okay, but now they've, they've been supplanted, as I mentioned, by the SSRIs, and these typically are going to be much more specific just for blocking reuptake of serotonin. Um, they increase those synaptic concentrations, uh, and really they're going to be found to be much safer for an overdose. Like I said, you can take 10 times overdose, 20 times overdose of your SSRI, not going to have a whole lot of uh, big issues versus if you took that much of a TCA, you're probably knocking on death's doorstep, right? So that's, that's not going to be good. Um, and they're also more tolerable from a side effect profile. So you don't see a lot of the sedation. You don't see a lot of the alpha blockade. You don't see all those other issues you see with TCA. So these are very good, very safe drugs for the most part. Um, but we'll see there are still some side effects associated with them. So the big ones we're going to have include citalopram or Celexa. We have s citalopram and Lexapro. What do you think the relationship is here? Yeah, one's the enantiomer, uh, escitalopram is an enantiomer of citalopram, right? This is the racemic mixture. Um, so just remember, if you're ever dose converting someone, you know, this is going to be basically 50% of citalopram. So um, if you had 10 milligrams, someone's on 10 milligrams of escitalopram, basically equals 20 milligrams of citalopram, right? And vice versa. So we'll have to do that occasionally. If a patient comes in on Lexapro and we have citalopram in our formulary at the hospital, we'll convert them over and really have no issues there, right? Because this is really the active form uh, that is getting the most therapeutic effect out of uh, we'll have fluoxetine or Prozac. Uh, fluvoxamine, I don't see too, too often, but then also paroxetine and sertraline. Um, these are, again, all, for the most part, very commonly used. You probably run into or at least heard of most of these brand names at some point in your life, probably seen commercials for them at the very least, right? Now, they have very low affinity here uh, at these other types of receptors. So, again, they're much better tolerated because they have very few side effects from that standpoint. See less weight gain associated with them. However, most common side effects you're going to run into is going to be GI upset headache, insomnia, and then some sexual disturbances. That's the most common reason why people are going to switch off of these and over to try something else because of sexual disturbances associated with that, right? Or um, sleep disturbances that have insomnia related back to that. Now, uh, just similar to if you're on like a corticosteroid, say, for greater than a week, what do you have to remember when you're discontinuing therapy for those patients? 
you have to taper off. Same thing goes for here, right? You need to taper off these medications slowly because you can't have withdrawal symptoms, uh, symptoms that come back, right? So um, because they're used to having that serotonin around, if you were to take that away and you relieve those transporters of the drug, all of a sudden that re transporter starts to work again, those uh, serotonin levels start to drop pretty precipitously. Because of that is where you see these withdrawal symptoms. So you can see increased anxiety, more sleep disturbances, um, again, more likely to have a recurrence of their depressive symptoms. So you need to taper it pretty slowly. But again, in some of these patients, compliance can be a big issue. So one of the things you can consider from a pharmacokinetic standpoint is to use a drug with a longer half-life. That means that if a patient were, if you are concerned about them stopping therapy abruptly, you can have them be on a longer half-life drug. So that way the taper is gonna be kind of built into it. So for instance, if you had, say, something where they say we're looking at concentration versus time here, uh, if you were looking at someone who stopped therapy on a very short-acting drug, you'd see the levels drop off pretty precipitously. And this is where you can see those withdrawal phenomenon happen. But if I have a long-acting drug or a long half-life, you would see these levels would take longer to kind of dip down. And so they kind of build into self-taper. This is also important if you're switching agents because you don't want to just go from one to the other. You need to kind of taper down on one and kind of come up on another um, in order to avoid those withdrawal kind of effects. And then you don't have too much of any one drug on it at a time, because otherwise we're in some serotonin toxicity, which we'll see in just a minute here. That makes sense? Okay, uh, so fluoxetine <laughs> tends to have the longest half-life, and so because of that, that one is gonna be best from a self-taper sort of standpoint, you would need to um, not worry quite so much about that withdrawal phenomenon. But the short-acting ones, certainly you would say, okay, we're gonna cut your dose in half, today and then we're going to do that for a week and we'll cut it at half the next time and maybe then go to every other day every three days and then you can come off right so you need to think about those tapers because otherwise um they can have some pretty significant they're pretty cranky um, when they come off their drugs uh too quickly uh it's no good for them it's no good for the people they're around uh as well anywho so um for most patients, you're going to find their anxiety does improve when they're on an SSRI. And for most people who have just uh, not depression, but just an anxiety disorder, SSRIs are still going to be recommended for kind of kind of long term maintenance uh, of prevention of those symptoms. Some people may actually get worse. So again, just know that a small subset may not really benefit all that much from from these. Um, and as far as kind of unique side effects go, just remember because again, you do still have to worry about these patients overdosing. It's still a risk for them. Um, you do see QT prolongation with citalopram and escitalopram. It's kind of a unique sort of effect with these. And we know the QT prolongation, you can see what potential issue. Torsage. Torsage, right? Typically not a big enough deal by themselves, but if you add them onto other medications, we're going to see some other ones you may use in addition to antidepressants. You're going to find that it can be synergistic, right? So a lot of patients who have, say, schizophrenia also have a degree of depression, or if they had bipolar disorder, they might be on antidepressant. We'll start to see some mixing of these drugs, and we can see, run into some issues that they take them all at the same time, right? So... Uh, black box warning, big thing to worry about here is that increased risk for suicidality. We've already talked about that. And again, most antidepressants are going to carry this warning. So just know it's kind of a class-wide effect um, that initially, that early period, you can see that increased risk for suicidality, especially in children, adolescents, uh, young adults is kind of where they've seen the most studies for that. So just let them know that, hey, you know, especially talk to their caregivers or their family. So listen, like these are things to watch out for. If you notice any kind of big changes in mood, if you notice they are, you know, just anything out of the ordinary, have them come back in. You guys can talk about it or go to the ER or whatever it happens to be um, because that risk is definitely there. You want to be careful and make sure you're monitoring for that sort of thing. Because, again, you know, people that commit suicide, they typically want – they make a big announcement about it and they say, hey, guess what? I just took all my medications. Sometimes they do, but more often than not, they lock themselves in their room or they go somewhere they can't be found. And so that's why you need to look for those warning signs kind of early, right? So any kind of big changes from the normal may be something to be concerned about, right? So anyway, uh, I mentioned this, uh, that possible mechanism that increased energy is something called akathisia. Have you guys heard of that term before? We'll talk about that when we get to the antipsychotics a little bit later on. But basically, it's this kind of feeling of like you're just not comfortable in your own skin. Like you just have this, like you just need to move. Just you need to like just, you know, get up and walk around or whatever. And so, yes, ma'am. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, anyway, when they have that, they, that's when they get that increased energy. And that's when you may find that they will act on those thoughts of self-harm uh, that they may have had previously, but they just couldn't act on it due to the lack of energy. Minus the self-harm part, didn't you say that people get when they take the Benadryl? Yeah, you can also see that there. Because that happens to some, like, I can take PO Benadryl and mm -hmm. fine, but IV, it makes you crazy. Yeah, you just, <laughs> right, when you just, like, want to, like, just, like, pull your own skin off, basically, and just. Yeah, it's like, you don't feel like, yeah. you can't explain it. That, yeah, it's a weird feeling. Yes, yeah, so some people are more prone to that than others, but that is something that you can certainly see here. The antipsychotics are definitely known for doing that as well. And that makes sense if you look at the kind of the chemical hierarchy of things, like, you know, the antihistamines and, and a lot of antipsychotics share some, some similarities. They share some lineage from, from a chemical standpoint, and that makes sense why they can have some bleed over those effects. So definitely something to consider. If you ever experience it, 
not fun, right? I know. I, suicide stuff, right, right. So not right, and you have to have that underlying um, kind of mental health issue to begin with in order to, to act on that sort of thing. Otherwise, you just feel miserable and you want to yes. jump out a window or something. Not really. You probably don't want to jump out a window. Maybe a first floor window or something. First floor. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not like hot, you know. I just I remember when I. Yeah. I remember when I had my. Yeah, I remember when I had my wisdom teeth taken. I don't know what I received. I was I was pretty young, so I wasn't really cognizant of drugs. I'm pretty sure I got propofol. Anyone ever seen propofol before? Yeah, it looks like milk, basically milk of milk of amnesia. That's what Michael Jackson was very fond of um, prior to his passing. And uh, I must have got like some Versed or something. But whatever it was, like I remember when the nurses were trying to pull me out of that chair to walk me to the recovery room. I, I almost like punched her. I was just like so just like get off me. But I was so wobbly legged I couldn't walk to save my life anyway. So it's just like it's, it's a weird feeling. But if you ever feel it, you'll you'll know it. And it can be sympathetic to your patients when they experience that. Because otherwise you're like, what the heck's wrong with you? Just chill out. You know, I can't chill out. It's the drugs you gave me. Stop. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Um, but for some patients, especially bipolar disorder, right, because with bipolar disorder, they only not have periods of depression, but also periods of mania, you could potentially uh, jump them over from a depressive state over into a manic state. So that's another thing you may see kind of early on with treatment of these drugs. All right. Uh, and then we have our SNRIs, and so these are going to be non-tricyclic antidepressants, right? So the, again, even though, as you correctly pointed out, they have a very similar mechanism to the TCAs, they lack a lot of those other side effects. They don't block alpha receptors, they don't block um, uh, cholinergic muscarinic receptors, they don't, they don't have a lot of those side effects. So that is beneficial. You're going to find a lot of these are being used for neuropathic pain, very similar to how the TCAs are being used, um, and also used for depression. So that is definitely um, the two main indications you're going to see these being used for. The two big ones, or the, the ones you're going to see most common are going to include venlafaxine or Effexor. You have desvenlafaxine, so you already know that relationship between these two, right? So desvenlafaxine being the enantiomer of venlafaxine. And again, why do they do that? Make money. Make money. Probably that's a cynical way to look at it. Sometimes they're limited, trying to limit side effects. So sometimes if the only one enantiomer is the effective one, the other one's causing side effects. That's one reason. Um, but again, they get a brand new patent. They have a whole new 20 years to use that. Um, so again, money is probably a, a big uh, push of that. Um, duloxetine or Cymbalta is another very common one you're going to run into. So these are probably the three most common ones you're going to see. Um, there's also mil, uh, milnociprin, and there's also this levomilnociprin, which again, levomilnociprin is just, the, again, the enantiomer. Again, it's very easy just to take one of those out, and then all of a sudden you got a brand new drug, so that's why you see a lot of those enantiomers come out uh, of the woodworks, essentially. So... For the adverse effects, you're going to see a little bit more GI disturbances associated with probably due to that norepinephrine effect, because again, you're not just getting serotonin uh, reuptake inhibition, but also ser uh, norepinephrine. Um, some sexual dysfunction is still going to be there as well. Um, and then also you can see due to that norepinephrine, you can see increases in, in blood pressure. So like venlafaxine especially has a kind of a dose-related increase in blood pressure. So if you had, say, a patient and like a test question came up, said, hey, this guy's got hypertension, but he's also got newly diagnosed <laughs> depression, which of these would be the best option, right? And so something like an SNR, it may not be good for him because his blood pressure is not under control, right? Because you can see that start to increase and that could be an issue. Um, duloxetine as well, you can see, you know, nausea, dry mouth, constipation, some insomnia. So again, a lot of this is related back to some of these uh, additional norepinephrine effects that you don't see uh, with just the plain SSRIs. So a lot of people will start off with an SSRI, see how they respond to that, and then they will, if that does not work, then try like an SNRI. It's usually kind of the next stepwise approach, and if they fail those, We'll find some miscellaneous agents we can try using, and then maybe a TCA might be on the docket as well. So again, typically SSRIs are your first go-to, first-line kind of drugs for these. Okay, so we have some mixed serotonergic agents. We have trazodone and nefazodone. Anyone ever heard of trazodone before? This is a very common one used uh, as a non-controlled substance for sleep aid because it is very, very sedating. Um, but not only does it block 5-HT reuptake, uh, but it also will actually inhibit this 5-HT2 antagonist. Difficult to say what kind of clinical uh, additional efficacy you get from this, but it's one thing to, to note there is different about its mechanism. Um, other unique thing you see with trazodone is it actually blocks alpha-1 receptors. So dizziness and hypotension are a big effect you're going to see from this. And we actually see this a lot when patients who overdose on trazodone Hypotension is a big concern for us. So, and again, they get hypotensive. What does the heart try to do to compete with that? Usually it speeds up, right? So you're going to find increased uh, contractility, increased inotropy, um, uh, chronotropy as well. So you're going to end up finding that you'll have a very tachycardic patient with very low blood pressure. It's typically how you would see it, like a trazodone patient. Nefazodone doesn't get used too much anymore due to cases of liver failure. And then we have this velazodone, which is actually a new one. Um, not a ton of experience with this one, but certainly trazodone is a very common one you're going to see in use out there. Um, as I mentioned, the hypotension is a big adverse effect to watch out for. A lot of sedation, which is, again, why we use it for 
uh, for sleep disturbances. And then trazodone, a unique side effect here is priapism, which does anyone know what that is? Yeah, kind of like unintended erection, sticking around is kind of uh, there. And it kind of makes sense based on, the, based on the mechanism, right? So you think about when we talked about urology last semester, um, you know, a lot of those drugs were used to open up that blood flow to the, to the penis, right? So you're having increased blood flow, alpha-1 receptors being blocked, you're opening up those vessels. Uh, you can imagine more blood flow happening there. And so it is one of those things that, you know, can be a urologic emergency. So if they are experiencing that, it's important to educate them on it. Let them know, hey, if you experience this, you need to come in and get uh, evaluated um, in order to have that uh, treated, right? Again, I mentioned often prescribed for sleep because it avoids having to use a controlled substance. So again, that's one thing I saw with a lot of mid-level practitioners, or if you have a practitioner who does not like to use controlled substances for this, we'll talk about sleep agents a little bit later, um, then they, this is a good option for that potentially. Have you ever heard of uh, bupropion? We've covered it in this class before. Anyone remember where? Yeah, it's smoking cessation. So yeah, so it'd be propion or Wellbutrin. Uh, this is the, the brand name it has for um, treatment of depression. There's also Zyban, which is the one for smoking cessation. This one uh, acts as a more novel kind of mechanism compared to a lot of the other agents we talked about. So for instance, this one's actually blocking uptake of norepinephrine, but the important thing here is dopamine, right? What does dopamine do for us? It's a happy drug, and because you think like serotonin is like the happy neurotransmitter, but dopamine, you're right, but what type of path, what type of happy? <laughs> Remember that reward pathway? But dopamine is very important for uh, rewarding you for certain things. So if I eat a juicy hamburger and it was delicious, dopamine gets activated. If I do a line of cocaine, I get very happy because a lot of dopamine is being released in that, um, uh, that you know, pleasure center, that reward center. Then that makes me want to do more cocaine. I want to have more hamburgers because I want to initiate that same dopamine release. That's how addiction happens, right? Um, so we're actually finding a lot of off-label use for bupropion um, for like eating disorders. So you actually see this mixed with um, a different drug. Uh, it's called naltrexone, which I'm not going to talk about too much here. Um, but basically, it's a, a drug where it tries to kind of reset that reward pathway. Uh, and you're actually seeing some weight loss associated for people who have kind of like a binge overeating sort of disorder. Um, so you may see some other uses for bupropion down the, down the line. But the main use we see for it is, is depression. And you mentioned that smoke cessation as well. And again, think about smoking also activates that reward center. That's why people get addicted to nicotine. This is why you can see it can be useful for having to kind of reset that reward pathway a little bit. So um, adverse effects, as far as those go, you can definitely see you know, typical nausea, vomiting sort of thing, insomnia potentially, but the ones we worry about, especially in overdose, are gonna be seizures and arrhythmias that can happen here. So that's one thing we want to monitor for. And then um, the big claim to fame here that a lot of people like bupropion for is there's less sexual dysfunction than the SSRIs. So if they're on Lexapro and they have anorgasmia or they are uh, decreased libido, this is something where you can switch over to bupropion and people tend to do a little bit better with this one because it has the least incidence of sexual dysfunction out of the group. So that's an important thing to remember, okay? Now, it's not a good drug for everybody, but if that is their main concern is a sexual dysfunction, this is a good one to switch to, right? Okay. Um, some other uh, random agents here, we have mirtazapine or Remeron. This is an antagonist actually at the presynaptic alpha-2 receptors. You guys remember where we saw those before where drugs interact with alpha-2 receptors? Used for blood pressure control. You got clonidine, then guanfacema. Those are actually agonists at the alpha-2 receptors. They actually decrease uh, outflow of uh, norepinephrine, right? Because those are sympatholytics, right? They decrease the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. This one actually works as an antagonist of those receptors, and so as you might imagine, if you shut that receptor down, you'd actually increase the outflow of things like serotonin uh, and, and norepinephrine, right? So that's how that's actually working to increase those levels by blocking that autoreceptor that normally shuts down for the release of that. Also, it has some activity to block serotonin 2 and 3 receptors and will antagonize histamine receptors. Again, this is a more of a kind of atypical sort of antidepressant, not one that might be used until like second, third, maybe fourth line agent uh, once they've kind of failed multiple other agents. But uh, some things you can see with it include somnolence, weight gain, dry mouth, constipation. So um, again, not used quite as frequently, but it's definitely out there for more treatment-resistant depression. Uh, this is another new one. It's called vortioxetine. Uh, this one's kind of um, probably the newest of the bunch we'll talk about here, but again, um, is working as an SSRI, so it's blocking reuptake of serotonin, but also is working as a 5-HT agonist. A partial agonist and then an antagonist. We mentioned that of the different uh, neurotransmitters, serotonin has the, the biggest number of subtypes, right? So you think about like alpha receptors, you have like alpha one and two, beta receptors, you have like beta one, two, and three. This has like, there's like 15 different types like serotonin sub, uh, sub receptors. So again, don't memorize this. Just know that it's gonna have some mixed activity for serotonin also working as an SSRI. So again, we don't really know why it's working, but we know these are the actions it's having here. Um, 
Again, sexual dysfunction is a, a big issue. You can see with this one, diarrhea, nausea. Um, the other thing to note from a kinetic standpoint is you can have people who are poor CYP2D6 metabolizers. Um, people who are slow to metabolize this drug, they can actually accumulate it and see more as for um, side effects, namely the serotonin syndrome is one of the big ones we'll talk about in a second here. So again, just kind of a unique one, uh, newer agent you're going to see out there potentially for some patients. Okay, so what is serotonin syndrome? Anyone describe it? Anyone know what it is? Basically, too much serotonin, right? As you might imagine, serotonin syndrome, you got too much serotonin. Um, this is usually going to uh, be seen with multiple agents that are blocking the uptake of serotonin. So, if I mix a TCA plus an SSRI, if I mixed, um, you know, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor uh, plus an SSRI, if I did any of those kind of combinations, that's where you're more likely to see that. And you think, well, when would you run into those situations? It happens more often than you think, especially with some drugs you may not think about as having effects with serotonin, like um, certain opioids can do this. Um, you know, if someone is getting a TCA for neuropathic pain and then they see a different provider and they get prescribed an SSRI for their depression, you know, so there's possibilities for this happening. Or, if, you know, they, they stockpile all their drugs they've ever been on and they decide to take all of them at the same time. It's another case where you may see that happen. But anyway, basically there's too much serotonin effect going on. And they develop kind of these four cardinal signs. They get this altered mental status. Of hyperthermia, you know, very, very hot in a lot of cases. Uh, some autonomic instability where they could be hypertensive, hypotensive, tachycardic, bradycardic. There's kind of um, a lot of instability there. And you'll see some increased muscle tone. So that this clonus that occurs, especially in the lower extremities. Um, and so when you see this, and again, you have to rule out a lot of other stuff. So you have to rule out make sure it's not an infection. You have to make sure you're not having um, any other kind of conditions. But um, I can see this occasionally. Um, and patients either overdosing or if they just happen to be on too many medications that are affecting serotonin at the same time. Again, it's one of the things you want to watch out for uh, as, as being a risk here. And again, there's is a spectrum. It's not going to be full blown. You know, their their fever is 107 and they're having rigid uh, extremities. It could be more mild than that. It could have you know, mild fever, some increased um, uh, rigidity in the, in the low extremities, and that may be it. So just be aware. Again, it's going to be related back to serotonin or drugs. That's why you want to look at the medication history and see what they're on. See if this might be one of those things that to consider. Other things you can see with it, sweating, you can see that, that clonus, that rhabdomyolysis can occur in really severe cases, which you mentioned, what is rhabdo? Muscle yeah, muscle breakdown is really rigid, so that's something you can see there. Um, really the big thing we want to, how to manage this is when we get their temperature down, so we use a lot of good hydration with IV fluids. Um, you do use evaporative cooling where you kind of you know, like can spritz them down with water and then put a fan on them, and that will help them to, to off uh, that, a lot of that temperature there. And then there's also a drug called ciproheptidine, this is actually an older school antihistamine um, that is sometimes used for appetite stimulation. You may see it used occasionally for that, but um, it actually blocks serotonin receptors as a potentially antidote we can use uh, for serotonin syndrome. So if that ever comes up, you know, ciproheptidine is a drug to use. All right. Uh, any questions from the first half? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So when you have, this is probably like a first semester question. But, um, right now it's the second semester, <laughs> or I guess third semester question. I mean, this is probably like intro in the farm, but it's now coming to mind. Okay. So when we have, um, it, just, it just came upon me. So when you have the enantiomers, yeah. like you know which one came first, but when it comes to dose and all that, like 10 versus 20, do we just look at the dosage forms or... So it's easy for you to tell too, right? So if you see something like citalopram and you see s citalopram or you see venlafaxine, you see desvenlafaxine. That the, long, the, long, the longer word is the second one, right? So right, so you have the parent molecule, which is the racemic mixture, usually has a shorter name, right? So you just have like s citalopram. Um, but if you have s citalopram, they added something to it, right? So again, they are denoting which chiral molecule it is, which hand, did, which hand of the molecule it is essentially, is the left hand or the right hand, that's where they're getting that name from. So you have to differentiate between the two. So if you have s citalopram, you would have, I don't know, I guess what the other one be? I'm trying to think. d citalopram or something. Oh, yes? Yeah, sorry. Let me, let me start recording again because I thought I was having a thought. Okay, yes. What did you say? The longer name, the less. The longer name is typically going to be one of those chiral molecules, right? So... If you're looking at albuterol, albuterol is the parent molecule, it's a mixture. You have lev albuterol. The other one would be dextro albuterol, right? That makes sense. Okay. I have a question about tapering. Um, so about what? About tapering. Okay. You've got someone on a drug, it's not working, so you've got to get them on something else. Do you taper them? Are there certain. I guess I'm wondering about drug interactions mm -hmm. and worrying like taking it away, mm -hmm. getting them on one versus. That's a great question. Actually, it's a good leeway into the next point on the slide. Fantastic. Thank you. It's a great segue. Love that.
Okay, so that's, that's a very important thing to consider is your the half-life of the medication, not only that, but also some of these have active metabolites, meaning that the metabolites themselves have antidepressant properties. They have serotonin reuptake blocking properties as well. So that's another thing that will extend the apparent duration of action of the drug because you saw those active metabolites sticking around. They can still work. So even if the parent drug is all gone, you may have metabolites that are left over. That's important when you think about things like fluoxetine or Prozac, which is typically the longer acting of all the SSRIs you have out there. Um, one, that's good for patients with compliance issues, because even if they miss a few doses, they can go right back on it, and they wouldn't really see much drop in their in, in efficacy, which can be good. Um, but you may need uh, uh, you may need to consider that tapering process, right? So again, if I were to say fluoxetine really wasn't working for my patient, they've been on it for six months. I know they have good tissue levels that have built up. They've definitely been in a steady state here. And now I want to switch them over to a different drug. I have to remember that if I were just to stop taking that fluoxetine, add on the other drug, they still have levels of fluoxetine that metabolize around, right? So that may be too much of a good thing around, right? And they could see serotonin toxicity, okay? That's why you have to consider that. So really you're basing off the of, off of patient um, kind of reporting based on like what their side effects are having, what sort of withdrawal effects they're having, and, and kind of based off of the kinetics here. So for something like fluoxetine, I may give them, say, like a week to start titrating down off their dose, while I may start the next drug at a very low dose, so a very uh, low starting dose, and then gradually titrate them up on that one. That way you don't really have any lapses in therapy, but you will not also have a low risk of having toxicity from that, right? And it's more of a, an art than a science, to be honest, when you're doing taperings and things like that. You ask 10 different providers, they'll do it 10 different ways. Um, and so that's why I'm not really talking too much about it here, but it's something you'll experience, you'll see, um, and you'll, you'll get a feel for it, right? So does that answer your question? Yeah. So again, it's one of those things where, yes, you must consider like how much drug is around. If it's a relatively short acting drug, then you really, that'll clear out of the body pretty quick. You can add on the next drug and it's not really going to be that big of an issue there. But the longer acting ones certainly you have to consider. Um, the other thing to look at is going to be if they have liver dysfunction. A lot of these are metabolized in the liver, so you'll find their half-lives can be extended uh, even several times normal in a cirrhotic patient. So always consider that the drugs will stick around for longer because most of these are going to be meta uh, hepatically metabolized. Okay. So as far as therapeutic monitoring goes, um, I can't really measure antidepressant levels because, again, their mechanism doesn't really tie in with the relief of depression, right? So you can't, there's no good corollary there. So the only way I can really monitor for efficacy is based on patient reporting, right? They have to tell me how they're doing, you know, how they're, you know, do their different depression scales and, and see how they're feeling. And that's gonna be your best guide. Also side effect monitoring is the other big thing you have to watch out for. And you're just titrating based on response, you know? So you give them four to six weeks, see how the drug's working for them. And if they're getting some benefit, but not a lot, then you can titrate the dose up, right? Or if they're having intolerable side effects, you can taper them off of that drug and switch them over to something else. So again, it's gonna be kind of a, um, again, more art than science in a lot of cases. If you talk to a psychiatrist or someone who does this day in and day out, um, they will give you much more of a nuanced sort of answer. And I, I you know, encourage you to seek those kind of providers out um, you know, on rotations and things like that. Um, a lot of times what I run into from my standpoint, at least from my experience, is either one, they've overdosed on the medication, right? Because they either had that acathesia or they just got to a point where they decide to overdose and take all their medications, or it is something where they're continuing therapy. They're coming in from an outpatient perspective. Um, they're being admitted to the hospital and then we're continuing therapy. And maybe they don't have, uh, they're on Lexapro and we have to switch them over to Citalopram. Those are kind of the things we have to consider um, switching them on based on new formulary and, and whatnot. Anywho, um, again, a full effect may take it up to six weeks. So remember to educate on that. Let them know, hey, it takes time. Don't quit early. Stick with me. We'll, you know, uh, monitor how it's going, and then we'll make decisions based on that six-week kind of report and that report card. Now, a lot of the newer agents like venlafaxine, duloxetine tend to lack a lot of those pharmacokinetic interactions, but you do want to be careful with the SSRIs and some of the uh, other newer agents, which are not kind of mentioned on that list. And they might have some variable effect on SIP inhibition. Yeah, I'm not going to get super in deep uh, in depth on that right now, um, but just know that the SIP interactions are definitely possible. Um, so, for instance, SIP, uh, TCAs are you get metabolized uh, pretty extensively through SIP enzymes. So, you want to look up interactions prior to prescribing. Make sure you're not going to do anything that lets those TCA levels start to creep up, because that's where you're going to see a lot more toxicity developing from that, right? Uh, some TCAs are even highly protein bound. So if you have other medications that are highly protein bound, that can kick that off. And all of a sudden, again, more free drug means more pharmacologically active drug. So you can see more side effects. So always consider these things. Just run an interaction report. You guys know how to do that? You know any resources to do interaction checking? So you guys all have access to up to date, right? 
Uh, today is linked into LexiComp. LexiComp is you know one of the primary drug resources I use on a day-to-day -day basis. They will have an interaction checker there, right? So you just will see a little tab that says drug interactions. Um, you click on that, you just type in all the drugs the patient's on, and it'll pop up with a list, and it'll tell you this is an X category interaction. This is a no-go. You don't want to mix these two, right? Um, or it'll say this is an A, B, C, or D sort of thing. Um, you know, A or B or C, you monitor for therapy. You know, a D, you start to get a little concerned about. X is like, probably don't want to mix those two drugs. Just get in the habit of running those checks to make sure you're not going to add on anything. I actually had a, a very close call just recently um, that happened. We had a patient who is a, a, a hemonc patient. They were on a study drug um, called nilotinib. And so it was a drug that uh, on their EMR, normally when you think about EMRs, they have very good uh, drug interaction checking already built into it. So if a patient says they're on X drug and you prescribe Y drug, it'll tell you if there's an interaction there. But unfortunately, because this is a study drug, it had a generic kind of heading. It just said study drug and then the comments said a lot in a patient taking blah, blah, blah. Guess what? No interaction checking at that point, right? So the patient had that on their outpatient list. Uh, the, the, it was entered in there correctly, you know, as far as they could do, because that the lot of it didn't have an entry to put it in. And so then the doc was uh, patient came with nausea, vomiting. Doc wrote for on Dansetron or Zofran. Do you remember anything Zofran does from a cardiac standpoint? Bradycardia. Bradycardia is an interval can extend. Um, yeah, QTC is a thing. And again, QTC is not usually a big issue by itself, but you add on to other drugs. Well, and then again, nilotinib is not a drug we deal with very often. It's an experimental drug this person was on, you know, so it wasn't something we're very well averse to. And so fortunately, you know, our interaction checker didn't come up with anything. Person normally, you don't go through and check to see, you know, if they're on that particular drug. So we just said, okay, Zofran looks good. Let's go ahead and give it to the patient. Fortunately, the patient said, hey, wait a second. I, the, my doc told me I can't um, take anything like this. Um, can you make sure you call them and, and make sure to double check? So, and then the nurse calls me up and says, hey, can you double check this interaction? Pull it up as like category X interaction. They're like, don't mix this ever. I said, okay, ooh, good thing the patient had the wherewithal to say something. I mean, it's like a teenager. So, you know, some teenagers would be very good about that. Other teenagers would be like, oh, whatever, I'll just take whatever you give me. Thanks. Um, so you have to consider those things. So that was a very close call. Could have led to some problems, right? And could have led to at least, at the very least, a, a follow-up EKG to make sure QTC wasn't getting too prolonged. And worst case scenario, see what? Or size, right? So it's a you know kind of a scary near miss that, that can happen uh, through no one's fault really. It's just one of those things where you know good thing the patient was educated and they knew to, to, to mention that. So again, keep those interactions in mind. Make sure you're checking through the home med list. Make sure what you're you're prescribing is not going to goof anything up from that standpoint. Yes. As long as the drugs are around, you're going to see that the effect is there, right? So say, for instance, you know, I normally set it at QTC of 440. If I go on a drug that extends it and I'm taking it routinely and say it sends it to 450, it's probably always going to be 450 as long as all other, all other variables stay the same. Certainly electrolytes play a role into that. So if I was hypomagnesemic or if my potassium changed big, you know, uh, drastically, that could affect it for sure. Or even calcium can affect it pretty significantly. Um, then that, that may change, right? Um, so it's one of those things where like, yeah, baseline, and this is why you want to see like, you know, what their baseline QTC is. And then you can look to see for changes over time. I've had several, you know, bone marrow transplant patients who are very immunosuppressed that had to be on uh, a ton of drugs. So immunosuppressed patients are more likely to see infections, right? So again, they were on antifungals, they were on antibiotics, they were on antivirals, they were on immunosuppressants for their bone marrow transplant, they were on a million other drugs, right? And so that's one of those things where it's like, it's a, it's a kind of a drug interaction nightmare and you have to just monitor everything very closely. And, you know, as a fortunate ICU patient, we can monitor for that, but they're just coming into the ED for nausea, vomiting, and they get one dose of that drug and then go home. Who knows what could happen, right? So yeah, monitoring is very, very As long as they don't have like a congenital, like prolonged QT or any sort of predisposition um, to that, right? Because some people just have a prolonged QT based on uh, congenital malformations or based on genetics or whatever it happens to be, uh, or due to electrolyte uh, changes, right? So I mentioned like hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia uh, can, can affect that pretty significantly. Um, so yeah, some people may just at baseline have a, have a prolonged QT. That could be, you know, a drug insult could, could affect that. Um, some drugs are more potent QTC prolongers than others. So for instance, pretty weak, but when you add it onto something else that could be pretty potent, like nilotinib, that's when you can run into problems. Yep, good question though. Anyway. Okay, so as I mentioned, any drug affecting serotonin can contribute to that serotonergic toxicity. So you always want to be careful mixing and matching these drugs. Um, but some things you may not actually think about can uh, be can cause some pretty significant interactions. So uh, linazolid, remember where we talked about linazolid? What do you use it for? 
MRSA or actually VRSA, a lot of times vancomycin resistant Staph aureus. So I think about VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, um, very potent antibiotic and gram positive killer. This actually has monoamine oxidase inhibiting capabilities, right? So when you have a patient who's coming into the ICU who needs uh, Zyvox is one of those things where you need to look at their med list and they're on antidepressant, you could see serotonergic toxicity from this. All of a sudden they get, the mental status has wide uh, fluctuations and all of a sudden they get more hypotensive and tachycardic. Okay, well, is it because they're septic or is it because they have this drug interaction? It's hard to tell at that point, right? So be careful with that. Um, anyone ever heard of methylene blue? It's used for several different conditions, um, but one of the things we'll do is it is a dye used in surgery. And so I actually had a patient who got, this is called at the poison center. They were on an antidepressant at home. They were coming in to get a parathyroidectomy and actually used methylene blue because it'll get preferentially uptaken into the parathyroids. And so it was, it would uh, basically make them much more clear for the surgeon to go in and, and excise essentially. And so the patient got methylene blue and all of a sudden they're on the, sur you know, on the uh, surgery table. And then all of a sudden, you know, the blood pressure starts spiking up. They get really hyperthermic and you're like, okay, well, are they reacting to the anesthetics? You know, are they having a bad reaction to that? Is it? And then once we looked at the med list, we we're able to figure out. No, it's probably serotonin syndrome they are experiencing due to that methylene blue having some monoamine oxidase inhibiting capabilities. So again, it's one of those things where you know you got to really uh, kind of think outside the box for some of these interactions. Uh, and you know, if patients not acting. Um, something going uh, unexpected. Look at the drugs. You know, that can sometimes be a common cause for all these problems. Uh, triptans, or um, you know, we talked about those for migraines, being serotonin receptor agonists, you know, that can have some uh, serotonergic toxicity there. You see increased blood pressure associated with that. We don't know those are vasoconstrictors. They'll consider that as well. Um, Oftentimes, if we can, ideally, you'd have a kind of a washout period. We'd give them two to five weeks before starting up one of these new drugs. But if someone has a VRE infection, do I want to have a two to five week period before I give them the Zyvox? A lot of times you can't do that, right? A lot of times it's life-threatening sort of infection. So you have to um, kind of just monitor and, and kind of treat through it, you know? Um, so it's one of those things where it's, uh, you don't have the luxury time in a lot of cases. But, but if, you know, if you're going in for surgery that's elective potentially, and maybe it's something you can hold off for, let the SSRI wash out and then, you know, have uh, get the dye, right? And then you go back on the antidepressant afterwards. So, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. As I mentioned, um, QT interval prolongation. So a lot of antiarrhythmics can do this, a lot of antipsychotics. And so one of the things we'll see with treatment-resistant depression, and you'll see a lot of commercials for this nowadays, they're adding on antipsychotic agents. Not the patient has schizophrenia, but they are finding that people have treatment-resistant depression. You know, add on antipsychotic, and that tends to have better efficacy. Um, so that is something you'll see. Again, monitor for QT when you have those kind of combinations coming about. And then also, you know, sedative agents, you want to watch out if they are on more of a sedating agent like a TCA or trazodone or something like that. If you're adding on alcohol, which again, you know, common thing a lot of depressed patients may abuse is alcohol, right? Uh, benzodiazepines as well. Um, we'll see benzodiazepines are very important uh, for the management of anxiety. So we'll see that as well a little bit later on. But again, mix those, you know, synergistic uh, uh, CNS depression, right? Not a big issue for the SSRIs. Those typically don't really cause a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, drowsiness uh, by any means, but TCAs, trazodones are big ones, right? Okay. Anyone ever heard of St. John's wort? I'd use some salicylic acid on that to get it off. It was kind of bad. Try to freeze it. It's not an actual wort. This is a plant. Um, it's an herbal supplement. So this is not regulated through the FDA. This is, um, and, and we don't talk about herbals too much here, but the regulation for herbals is much, much different than it is for uh, you know, prescription-based products, uh, for better or for worse. But um, St. John's Wort, if you had a patient who was really kind of into more natural means of treating depression, this is a okay option. Um, this is, has a product in it called Hypersin, which is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So it, it certainly can work for some more mild forms of depression. So there's certainly no, nothing saying your patient shouldn't take that. But the problem is, I can go anywhere and buy this stuff, right? I can go to the GNC and get St. John's Wort. Um, you need to ask the question to make sure they're not taking something like this or they know not to take this. Uh, when you're giving them antidepressants. So say they come into you, you give them uh, an SSRI, so I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna prescribe you 50 milligrams of Zoloft, go on your way, uh, and they say, well, you know, I'm glad I'm getting this tr you know, depression fixed, but you know, my friend really had some uh, good St. John's Wort, let me go try that as well. Add that on board, now all of a sudden, serotonin toxicity can be a risk. So let them know, hey, avoid St. John's Wort if you're gonna try one or the other, that's fine, but you don't wanna mix these two together because the, the problem's gonna be there. Other big problem you run into is that uh, St. John's Wort is huge for drug interactions because it's a CYP3A4 inducer. Also, it's another product called P-glycoprotein. So you will see levels of drugs that get affected by these two drop pretty precipitously. So it's another thing where if they're on a statin, you know, say they're on their simvastatin for hyperlipidemia, they go on this, all of a sudden those levels are going to drop, cholesterol maybe will go up. Okay, So keep that interaction in mind. Um, again, always ask about herbals, ask about non uh, prescription products, I don't know about anything that, you know, uh, dietary supplements, make sure you're asking those kind of questions because um, patients may have different kind of 
uh, nomenclature in their mind, you want to make sure you kind of elucidate all of those because you can miss something like this and this could be a big, big issue, right? <clears throat> Okay, with uh, elderly patients, uh, oftentimes these are kind of overlooked as far as depression goes. Um, you know, the, uh, especially some of these uh, kind of older, uh, uh, you know, people, especially like some of like the aging baby boomers and, you know, especially those like my grandparents, like they were kind of um, tough as nails, kind of like lived on the side of a mountain kind of people. And they're like, we don't have depression. We don't need to worry about mental illness. Yeah, you do. Like you, you still get depression just like everyone else. And so it's important that they don't get overlooked. Um, but especially with the, you know patients get, as they get older, you see some increased suicidality after 65 years of age. But make sure you're doing a good um, medication overview. Look for those interactions. Make sure to look at their liver function to make sure they're not going to have an extended half-life um, related to some of these. And you're going to see that you again want to avoid CNS depressing drugs for these patients because again that can worsen dementia, it can worsen their memory. So stick with things like SSRIs, stick with things like SNRIs. You're going to run into less of that mental status um, changes. Um, have you guys ever heard of the Beers List before? I always joke the beers list you get over at the bar, the you know, I'm just kidding. It doesn't have that. But um, beers list is basically a list of drugs you don't want to give to elderly patients. We will cover that later on in the Jerry section towards the end of the class. So just kind of keep that in mind. But a lot of these CNS depressing drugs are going to show up on that beers list as agents you really don't want to give to elderly patients due to issues of falls or issues of cognitive impairment, et cetera. So keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, for pediatrics, um, this is actually probably more prevalent than we actually thought, um, and a lot of medications are not super well studied for kids. So again, children are not just little little adults. We'll cover that a little bit towards the end of the class as well. Um, but just know that a lot of these drugs don't have specific indications for treatment of depression in young patients, but we will still use these drugs anyway. So for instance, like fluoxetine actually has an indication for kids less than 18. However, uh, a lot of other drugs get used um, with you know little issues. The matter is just like what, what's the optimal dosing? We don't really know. So a lot of it's again start low and titrate uh, to, to clinical effect for those patients. And again, watch out because a lot of those drugs also have that increased risk for suicidality early on. So you need to monitor for that. Have the family monitor them. You know, is it just a moody teenager? Or are they really you know having a change where they could be a, a risk for harm to themselves? Always consider that. Right. Okay. Uh, for pregnant lactating patients, we'll talk more about this in the OB-GYN section. I'm not sure when we cover that, but it's sometime in this class. Um, but you're going to see more and more SSRI use in a lot of pregnant patients, uh, mainly due to the fact that they have a lot of anxiety associated with pregnancy. Um, you know, mommy guilt is a really big thing, and a lot of moms do not want to have any kind of medication exposure uh, on the fetus. But we are finding uh, that, you know, SSRIs are relatively safe in, in pregnancy. And again, um, you know, depression, postpartum depression is a big deal for a lot of these patients. And so we need to make sure we're treating them effectively, otherwise it can lead to harm to themselves or potentially harm to, to their babies, right? Uh, so you have to be careful with that. We don't have a ton of like long-term data to say, you know, what's going to happen to these babies that were exposed to SSRIs for 30, 40, 50 years. We don't have that study uh, information yet, but one day we'll have that. But in the meantime, for treatment of the mom, it seemed relatively safe for the most part. Um, some of them may have some risk of being underweight or have pulmonary issues, but um, you know, in, in general, it's, it's relatively safe. But it's a conversation you have to have with that patient to see you know, what are they comfortable with. Because if they're not really comfortable taking it, it doesn't matter what you tell them, they're just not going to take it. For instance, getting my wife to even take Tylenol when she was like having aches and pains during pregnancy was like a no-go. She's like, no, I don't need it. I'm tough. I'm like, okay, you can be tough all you want, but you're going to be hurting, so that's fine. <laughs> Anywho, um, generally when you're treating these patients, start with an SSRI or a newer agent. Uh, SNRs are probably fine, but SSRIs are generally uh, our, our standard go-to. So like Zoloft, uh, you know, sertraline, paroxetine, fluoxetine, whatever you want. Um, TCA is not going to be preferred unless um, they have some other compelling indications. So maybe they have neuropathic pain. That's probably an okay patient to use that for. And then MOIs are going to be a last resort. Generally avoid them unless they uh, fail mostly everything else. Okay. Or treatment failure goes, you really want to assess for compliance because, again, the patient's telling you, yeah, of course I'm taking my drug. Does that always mean they're taking the drug? No, we always say in talks, we say, how can you tell if a patient's lying? The lips are moving, yeah. So, um, again, don't always assume they're telling you the truth there, but try to assess compliance as best you can. Um, and then you may need to switch agents in the same class. So, again, um, some people don't respond well to Lexapro, uh, escitalopram. They may respond well to sertraline, right? So there's no, nothing saying they can't switch between SSRIs. Um, more likely than not, you'll probably see someone go from an SSRI to an SNRI to try that out and uh, see how they respond to that. But ma just make sure they have kind of an adequate washout and you're not starting a new agent too soon and when you're starting to taper off the old one. Otherwise, you can run in that serotonin uh, toxicity. And then we'll talk about some other agents. Um, we'll talk about some mood stabilizers like lithium. We'll talk about atypical antipsychotics later on in this section. Um, so we'll kind of go back to that later. But you may see some additional um, uh, people are getting some additional benefit from adding on drugs of a completely different classification uh, to help treat that depression. 
question. Yes. What benefit, well, how much of a benefit would you get switching agents in the same class? Like I said, a lot of it depends on the uh, pharmacogenetics of the patient. Some people just respond better to one versus another, or it could be a side effect thing to where like, you know, if they're saying like, hey, my, you know, libido is really taking a hit. Like I don't ever feel like having sex and, you know, it's really causing a strain in my relationship. Maybe, you know, some like Lexapro is not good for them. They switch over to like sertraline and they'll fix everything, right? Hard to say. Um, but a lot of times though, if you hear someone that has pretty significant sexual dysfunction, switch over to be appropriate. That's generally a pretty uh, safe and, and good one to go with from that standpoint. So right. Very patient dependent. This is, uh, I wish I could tell you, go this one, then try this one, then try this one, but it's really going to be much more patient dependent, right? And a lot of times you'll find that it's dependent on what can their insurance cover. Uh, it'll depend on the providers you're working with, like what are they used to doing and what do they prefer to use? Because uh, again, everyone's going to have their own kind of uh, armamentarium of drugs they like to use. You know, I'm teaching you hundreds of drugs, but you'll probably settle on like 50 to 80 drugs or something like that you'll ever use in your whole career, depending on where you work. Uh, that's just the nature of the game, but you know, this is why I get you at least exposed to every, a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any questions on depression? Continue on to talk about bipolar disorder in a little bit. I, I think this is an important point. I think a lot of people, um, you know, at least I did for a long time, I didn't really have a good understanding of depression. I was like, you just need some positive mental attitude. You just need some PMA. <laughs> Everything's going to be good. Like, I've never had to deal with depression, right? Um, but that's really not how it is. You can't just change, tell someone to change their, their frame of mind. It doesn't work like that. Um, you really need to treat it like a true illness, just like, uh, you know, if someone just got their hand chopped off. You can't just be like, you just need to think about this in a, in a more positive light, you know? Uh, get some cool prosthetics, maybe a robot hand, right? It doesn't work like that, right? So you need to need to be cognizant of that and be, be um, you know, be uh, sensitive to their, their needs and, and their desires, right? Anywho, moving on to bipolar disorder. What is bipolar disorder? You have two poles, right? You're really happy, really sad, right? So there, there's kind of a, a spectrum you can go between there, these kind of manic phases or these kind of depressive phases, right? And so they'll kind of go back and forth depending on several different factors. But it's usually kind of a chronic condition. This is a cyclic mood disorder. I'm not going to get into the, the various and specific types of bipolar disorder, but I'm going to go over the drugs we usually use to treat these drugs, uh, treat these agents. We've covered a lot of these already. You'll see a lot of the mood stabilizers we're going to use here. We're covered in the anti-epileptic um, section in the in neurology. Um, but basically, it's a lifelong illness for a lot of patients, um, and so we're going to see that we're really going to focus here on the pharmacologic therapy, but there's a lot of non-pharmacologic therapy that goes along with this. It's really important. Um, we don't know why people develop this. Uh, it could be nature. It could be nurture. It's hard to say. It's probably a combination of the two, including neurobiologic factors, you know, uh, psychological factors, uh, et cetera. Um, some of it may go down to the actual the neuronal circuitry and maybe due to uh, specific function of certain neurons or certain neurotransmitters being affected here. And again, it's one of those things where we don't know who's going to respond well to which drug, so it's one of those things where you have to kind of try several things to find what's going to be best for your patient in a lot of cases because we don't really have any idea. But there's several types, um, you know, that you can have um, – uh, various degrees of how often they're going to be switching from different um, kind of poles of their disease, how, how recurrent it's going to be, uh, et cetera. Again, typically you're going to find, at least for our purposes, in a more kind of a generalist sort of uh, uh, standpoint, um, we're going to kind of lump a lot of these together because the treatment really doesn't change a ton between, uh, between them, as we'll see. Uh, lots of other causes for mania that you can see. Um, these kind of manic episodes, certainly CNS disorders. I think stroke, tumor could be uh, behind some of these. You can have CNS infections. They can affect mental status, uh, electrolyte abnormality, endocrine disorder. So again, these are things you would typically want to rule out before you go in and thinking, yes, and diagnose them with bipolar disorder. Um, you know, steroids, hallucinogens, alcohol, and toxic. There's lots of drugs that can be involved with this as well. So you want to take those into account and rule those things out uh, first as well. But our goal here, we want to try to eliminate uh, current symptoms and have complete remission, right? So we don't, don't want them to be in the depressive state. We don't want them to be in the manic state. We want to kind of even them out, kind of get them more close to the middle, right, to kind of a nice baseline. Um, the problem you're going to run into with some of these patients is that a lot of them actually like their manic phase, especially if they're a little bit more mild um, because they have a lot of energy. They get a lot of stuff done. Their house has never been cleaner than it's ever been. Um, so they kind of like that. And so, again, you'll find that, like, why do I need treatment for this? A lot of times you may find it difficult for them to be compliant with the what you're actually prescribing them. Of course, when they go down, they flip to the other side of that thing, then it's going to be pretty severe, and then they you know, feel like crap. So maybe anyway, we want to prevent recurrence of symptoms if we can. I'd like to get them to a baseline psychosocial functioning. Some patients, when they get to a really manic phase, like they uh, are not quite so um, – productive with their time, but it could be a lot of things where they're turning to a lot of drugs and alcohol. It could be um, they cannot keep a job uh, appropriately. They don't have a, uh, appropriate relationships with people. So it can be very, uh, uh, you know, can be very dysfunctional sort of lifestyle. 
you want to hopefully get their psychosocial functioning kind of back. And so this is where a lot of like, you know, case managers and things like that can be very useful for, for helping with these patients. Um, like to maximize adherence, minimize side effects if we can, and then we'll look at any kind of contributing substances. So if they have alcohol problems, you know, um, they have stimulant uh, addictions, anything like that, try to fix those underlying problems. So this is just going to aggravate, um, you know, alcohol on the depressive side and definitely stimulants on the more the manic side, right? And of course, alcohol, like you know, especially on a manic person, does that help you make better decisions typically? No, you, all your inhibitions are gone. Uh, and so again, that can lead to even worse decisions being made there. But, um, and again, just think about things like stressors and substances can certainly precipitate some of these acute episodes. Always keep that in mind. This is where journals and diaries can be very useful or, or you know, family members can kind of help out with some of these uh, triggers. Um, as I mentioned, therapy is very individualized. We don't know who's going to respond really to which agent. Uh, and again, those frequencies and severity can really differ between uh, person to person. I'm going to kind of focus on both the uh, pharma and non-pharmacologic therapies. But typically, uh, patients should remain on a mood stabilizer. We'll talk about a few of these, like lithium and valproic acid, for their lifetime. They should uh, not necessarily, a lot of people don't tend to grow out of this. They should remain on stay on their lifetime. That way they kind of keep them hopefully at their baseline as long as you can. And then we'll look at some medications that are used better for acute symptoms. Okay. So um, obviously we want to look at, you know, reducing stress, make sure you have good, good exercise. And I talk about mood charting that can help to identify certain episodes or certain stressors related to certain episodes and a lot of supportive counseling. Again, adherence is going to be a big problem for a lot of these patients because a lot of times they don't feel like they need any kind of help with this stuff. And so it can be very difficult to, to have them be compliant with this. However, we do have drugs that can be very useful for helping to stabilize that person's mood and kind of help to treat those, some of those manic uh, episodes here. So uh, lithium, they would know that lithium used to be contained in 7-Up. It used to be the original lithiated soda. So you might imagine people got a very nice mood when they were in uh, drinking 7-Up. Um, anyone know any other illicit substance or any illicit substance that was in a commercial product? There used to, yeah, it used to be cocaine and Coca-Cola, so that's where that name comes from. Unfortunately, I took that out, so that's just a lot of sugar. <laughs> I fructose corn syrup, uh, syrup. That's, all, that's all that's in there now. They also took uh, lithium out of 7-Up because it turns out lithium can be very toxic, uh, as it turns out. So this has been around for a long time, you know, basically since, you know, the earth has been here, essentially. Right? It's a heavy metal. Um, but it's uh, uh, been used since 1949 uh, as, as a treatment for mania. We don't really know how it works. Some people think it has to do with things like gene expression, some neuroprotective effects. We don't really know. We just know that it works. Um, so lithium, the things to note here is that it works a lot like sodium in the body. It looks just like sodium. And if you looked at them on the periodic table, you'll notice they're, they're kind of, they're neighbors there, right? So they're on the, on the same kind of, uh, area of the chart, neighborhood of the chart, I should say. And so the body looks at lithium like it does sodium. So if you're in a state where you want to hold on to sodium, you want to hold on to lithium. If you're in a state where you want to get rid of sodium, you want to get rid of lithium as well. The kidneys can't tell the difference between the two. And that'll become important when we're looking at some of these drug interactions that happen because lithium is one of those things you have to monitor levels for because if they go out of whack, this can be a very, very dangerous drug, right? So remember how I said TCAs uh, can be potentially life-threatening sort of overdoses? Lithium can be the same thing. And a lot of times people will get over, uh, their levels on lithium will go high and of no fault of their own, like they took too much of it. A lot of times has to do with things like drug interactions, dehydration, et cetera. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And again, does not get metabolized in the body, only gets eliminated through the kidneys. So that means if you have changes in kidney function, you're going to have changes in how quickly you can get rid of lithium as well. So um, we still consider this one of the first line therapies for mood stabilization, but it's starting to take a backseat to a lot of the anti-epileptics we're using nowadays. Um, and due to the side effect profile is a big thing in, in monitoring, et cetera. Um, Efficacy still takes some time to kick in, so you know several weeks before you really start to see the full effects here. Um, but it can be helped, uh, or can be helpful, in order to prevent some of these manic episodes and reduce some of that suicide risk. Because again, as another component, you may see with these manic episodes that happen there. Um, you have to monitor the serum concentrations and make sure they do not get too high. Notice here that it's monitored in milliequivalents per liter, very similar to how like a, a other cations are like sodium, right? Sodium is a milliequivalent per liter. Same thing here. Um, notice it's a pretty tight range here. You know, you don't, you don't have to memorize the number. But just know it's a very tight range, uh, big fluctuations, you know, in either direction can lead to either failure of therapy or can lead to some pretty significant um, uh, neuro effects, as we'll see in just a little bit. So um, be careful with abrupt discontinuations, why compliance is so important, because it can lead to remission of symptoms. We want to be careful with that. Um, and occasionally it'll be mixed with other mood stabilizers, but typically try to use one at a time and try to avoid combination therapy, because again, adding on more drugs just means more side effects. Now, it can range who's going to have side effects pretty widely, as you can see here. The biggest thing you're going to run into are some uh, adverse effects due to kind of dose-related phenomena. So you get kind of a peak effect. You want to two hours after you take the dose, since we can see some of these things. A lot of GI distress, 
Yeah. You're also putting an ion into the GI tract and causing osmotic sort of diarrhea, so you want to watch out for that as well. Um, you see some muscle weakness, lethargy, and then also some polydipsia and nocturia, right? Makes sense, though, because, like, you know, the kidney senses, there's more of a sodium-like substance around. It's going to try to get rid of it. So you can see some polyuria associated with that one, right? So the more common thing you're going to run into is these kind of chronic effects you're going to run in, into. And this is kind of chronic deposition of, of the lithium in the CNS in particular. So you can see things like fine hand tremor that happens here. Um, some people get some benefit from using maybe long-acting formulations. may help to prevent the levels from getting quite so high. Some people also benefit from beta blockers. It can kind of help to block some of the uh, that, that tremor stimulus from those beta receptors in the skeletal muscle. Some people benefit from that. And you can also have a di uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Anyone ever heard of diabetes insipidus? What is that? Patients are losing a ton of water. Like the kidneys can't really regulate uh, salt and water retention anymore, and so they just end up peeing out everything. So a huge polydipsia, um, so, uh, polyuria uh, that can be seen with that. So. Um, can actually be managed with a loop or thiazide diuretic, which doesn't really make sense. You think you're treating, they're peeing a lot if you're treating with a diuretic. I don't want to get into the mechanism too much here. Just know that as one thing where uh, actually some diuretics can help to manage that, but it's something to watch out for. So if your patient's like, yeah, I feel better, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm peeing like all the time, that could be a sign you may want to monitor things like their electrolytes and et cetera. Um, I mentioned some nephrotoxicity, which is possible. And then actually, it's interesting is that lithium can interfere with thyroid hormone synthesis, and you can actually see hypothyroidism. And we know that hypothyroidism can also lead to what kind of mood changes? This is your like, energy levels. Decrease. You get more of kind of a depressive sort of state. So it's going to actually exacerbate potentially the kind of depressive pole of their, their bipolar disorder, right? So um, some other chronic effects, you see some cardiac effects, some bradycardia, AV block potentially. Um, you see some skin manifestations like acne uh, can be uh, somewhat commonly seen with lithium. Uh, weight gain and slurred speech and ataxia. This is more from the CNS deposition here. Again, these are chronic effects over months to years. You're going to see some of these develop. You don't have to watch out for it. And then um, as far as overdose goes, this can be very dangerous. So we'll talk about drug interactions that lead to this, but there's what we call either acute or chronic overdose. We think the difference is between those two. One's absolutely yeah. So there's acute, which is just kind of like okay, I decide to take all of it at one time. You get a very big level, it goes up. That's one kind of overdose. There's the more chronic ones though, and those are more insidious because that is a chronic buildup over time. So say for instance, the patient's renal function takes a hit that no one's monitoring for. I'll start to climb up, climb up, climb up very slowly, but those can be much more dangerous because that means more that uh, lithium gets across and into the brain, and the more longer it's there. And again, think about lithium; it's a positive ion. Positive things don't like to cross that blood-brain barrier very easily, right? But once it crosses, it's kind of stuck there for a while too because it doesn't like to cross the other direction. So once it's there, it kind of sticks there for a while, and that's where you can run into some issues. And, and seizures can be one of the big things you see. A lot of that tremor comes back, um, so you've got to be careful with that. Uh, uh, from a chronic standpoint, you want to monitor for these levels. You're starting to see why we don't use it as often, why we're starting to use these other agents that have less monitoring associated with them. You would probably monitor... Anytime you change any kind of drug management, as we'll see with some of these interactive medications, anytime you're changing a drug that might affect that, you want to monitor for it. Probably, do it, um, probably within, say, a week or two after you first start it, and after any dose change, probably another week or two. Because, again, the half-life should be relatively short, so by the time you get to that week, it should be at steady state, essentially. Um, and then anytime you're experiencing toxicity, we'll check that again. Uh, if they're experiencing, say, you know, an acute manic episode, you may want to check a level to see if they're, maybe they're not taking it. You could do it months in between if they're kind of they're happily riding through, and then you could you know extend it out. It depends on your patient how you know do they have concomitant disease states? Like they have uh, kidney disease, you're having to monitor for as well. You know, so it's one of those things where uh, if it's an otherwise healthy patient, they're having no problems, you can go months in between checking once they get a steady state. Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned, anything that can cause your body to hold on to more salt is going to cause you to hold on more lithium. You can see these kind of chronic overdoses occur. So dehydration, sodium restriction, vomiting, heart failure, cirrhosis, all that can lead to drug accumulation. So watch out for that. And then actually some drugs can affect this as well. So anything that can lead to the kidneys being in the state where they're either getting decreased renal blood flow or if they're holding on to more salt. So for instance, I'll give a thiazide diuretic and I start to pee out a bunch of salt. The body compensates for that, right? It wants to hold on to it. It's that diuretic breaking we mentioned uh, last semester. Um, NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors can do this as well too, right? So if you um, cause changes to that afferent and efferent arterial, that would decrease your uh, renal blood flow. That's going to decrease uh, that filtration that occurs there. So you hold on more lithium. So this is a, one of the big things we run into with some regularity. Someone's on lithium for their bipolar disorder. They're riding fine. They're doing okay. And all of a sudden they start taking NSAIDs for like an injury. 
Now all of a sudden the level starts to rise up and they get these CNS manifestations and they can't figure out what happened. They usually do the NSAID that they're taking. And again, a lot of NSAIDs are over the counter, so you have to ask about them very specifically to make sure that you are catching that sort of use, right? Um, no SIP interactions, fortunately, because again, it's all going to be renally eliminated, right? Because it's just a metal, it's not going to get uh, metabolized at all. Okay, so that's lithium. And then we have the other uh, anticonvulsants that we use for bipolar disorder. I can go over these pretty quick since we've already covered these and you're going to be studying for these anyway. Uh, for the neuro section, that's going to be on this test, right? So one of the big ones, and probably one of the more common ones I'm starting to see nowadays, is valproic acid, Depico, Depicon, Depikine, uh, sodium valproate, however you want to call it. It's all valproic acid to me, essentially, right? Um, now, this is probably the most prescribed mood stabilizer that's out there. Uh, it's good for both acute mania. So if you had a, a person who has an acute manic episode, this is a good drug. You can actually start them off with an IV dose of bolus to kind of get them under control, to kind of chill them out a little bit from the manic st standpoint, and then you can put them on it for chronic therapy. So that can be a very uh, good agent for that. Um, again, you can go back to the mechanism. We don't really know why it's working for bipolar disorder necessarily, but it could have to do uh, with you know some of the, the effects of GABA, some of those postsynaptic receptors. Again, it's one of those things we don't know why it works, but it tends to work, right? So that's why we use it. Um, and you will find it may have some synergistic, synergistic actions if combined with other agents. So, um, again, you may see some additional benefit mixing this with lithium, but your side effect profile tends to get worse, right? So, you can always worry about that when you're combining these things. And a lot of these patients are going to be on a mood stabilizer for the manic portions of it. And then what else do you think they might be on? Hmm? Probably an antidepressant for the depressive standpoint, right? So, typically, you're going to find that, again, in a lot of these psych patients may be on three, four, or five different medications to kind of manage all these different things. Um, and so you need to watch out for that. These drug interactions are super important. So at the very minimum, there should be on a, uh, like an SSRI and probably one of these mood stabilizers. So again, you're already starting to watch for these interactions. Um, we already talked about adverse effects. Again, watch out for things like, um, you know, the platelet effects here, the hepatotoxicity. Again, think about, um, you know, um, the teratogenicity of alproic acid. Imagine, you know, some of these patients they make very poor decisions when they're not having a manic episode, and that can include risky sexual behaviors, right? So you have to worry about them getting pregnant and things like that potentially. Um, so again, other things to, to kind of warn them about. Then when we talk about the ob gyn section, we'll talk about certain agents that are good for kind of long-acting um, uh, contraception that are good for, you know, these patients who may have poor compliance or, um, you know, that may be a high risk. These are things like a depo shot can be very good, like a, a, a medroxyprogesterone is good for keeping them. Uh, yeah, you know, as a contraceptive for you know three months at a time and things like that. So these are things you can kind of consider. And as far as monitoring goes, um, you know, monitoring hepatic function is a big one, and then also looking at their the, their levels as well. Again, this is more kind of a titrating based on see how their symptoms are, but make sure they're kind of somewhere in this range. Again, uh, if I'm putting levels on the test, it's going to be um, I'll put reference ranges on there as well. Um, so you'll be making decisions based on that, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. But you don't have to memorize the number, just know those are out there. This is one we would do therapeutic drug monitoring for. We also use carbamazepine or Tegretol. Again, this actually has some uh, structural similarity to the TCAs that we already talked about. So um, again, we don't really know the mechanism. Again, we know it works, but mostly you're going to see the anticonvulsant properties from blocking sodium channels. Remember, that's the main mechanism we'll use it for as an antiepileptic drug. Um, not used as a first line, but it could be good if a patient was, say, refractory to lithium. You may be able to switch them over to something like this, or they fail valproic acid, switch them over to something like Tegretol. Maybe a good option for them, potentially. Again, another one we do therapy drug monitoring for. We already talked about the um, side effects we can see with this one. Watch out for their sodium, right? Remember carbamazepine. Oxcarbazepine, you think sodium monitoring because you worry about SIADH, right? Watch out for that. And then watch out for inducing uh, SIP interactions, so like 3A4, especially with carbamazepine. Um, also, you know, some of the 2C uh, categories as well, but anticonvulsants can be affected by this oral contraceptive, so keep that in mind. Uh, Oxcarbazepine can be used as well, so trileptal. Again, think about them very similar to carbamazepine, just more, uh, fewer drug interactions, but more uh, from the sodium standpoint. So again, monitor for hyponatremia. But no monitoring for that one because we don't really use levels for oxcarbazepine, just carbamazepine. Um, again, uh, find a little bit of minor effects here on SIP enzymes, but again, not as much as carbamazepine, but again, very similar side effects. Uh, Lamotrigine or lamictal is another one we can use occasionally. Again, uh, working as inhibiting glutamate, blocking some sodium channels. Um, this one actually has a little bit of antidepressant effect as well as being a mood stabilizer. So you get a little bit of double duty out of this one, which is nice. Um, be careful if you're mixing this with valproic acid. I kind of mentioned those interactions before. Remember how we have to change the lamotrigine dose based on if there's a uh, an inhibitor of its metabolism or an inducer, right? This would be one of those ones where valproic acid actually inhibits its metabolism. So what would I need to do with the dose of lamotrigine? 
I'd have to reduce it by half probably if I was starting out, right? Use half the starting dose to make sure I avoid other side effects. What's another big thing you worry about with lamotrigine from a side effect standpoint? Think dermatologic reactions, right? Think rash, Stevens-Johnson Stevens -Johnson syndrome, uh, blisters, ulcers, things like that. Those are warning signs, and they need to discontinue use for those drugs, uh, for Lamictal, right? Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so that's all the drugs we would use for um, uh, sort of anticonvulsants we would use for bipolar disorder. I think I have a little bit of talk on antipsychotics here. Okay, um, some patients will benefit from using antipsychotics. We'll cover these in uh, more detail in the antipsychotic section uh, within this PowerPoint, so we'll do that next week. Um, but we generally, first generation and second generation agents. Um, the primary thing these are doing are blocking dopamine receptors, um, especially the first generation agents. And remember, these are D2 receptors. Remember where we saw dopamine 2 receptors previously? What disease state? We're going to get a lack of dopamine. Parkinson's, yeah, so we saw Parkinson's. So this is actually a way we can actually induce a chemical Parkinsonism by blocking dopamine for these patients. So that'll be important when we think about side effects later on. So we'll talk about that again. Um, but again, these are good for either mono or combination therapy for treating acute mania. So again, um, think about like valproic acid, carbamazepine, lithium. Those are good for really chronic management. Valproic can be used occasionally for acute management. These are really good for really just like knocking down someone who's like a really, uh, you know, something that really bad manic episode, they are either a danger to themselves or others, uh, they're very aggressive. You can knock them down pretty quick with one of these antipsychotics because these are very sedating agents and will kind of help chill them out and get them to a point where they can kind of be managed. You can talk to them, have a conversation, and hopefully get them to a point where you can get them started on some better maintenance therapy, right? Um, so especially effective if they have agitation, aggression, psychosis is happening here. These are really good patients, uh, uh, good, um, uh, good agents to use for them. Because again, the sedation is nice, but it's be able to kind of get them down uh, from that kind of a really high acute point down to somewhere where they're a little bit more manageable, which is good. Um, we don't know about the long-term therapy. We'll talk about the chronic side effects next week, but just know there's a lot of metabolic conditions that happens here. Most of these patients will not be on these uh, long-term. Typically, they're going to be switched over to like a mood stabilizer for more chronic therapy. Most often, but um, again, we'll talk about adverse effects, drug interactions later on next week. Uh, a few alternative agents you may use for bipolar disorder, um, benzos, uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, we've kind of mentioned these already as being good for seizure management, right, for acute seizures. Um, how do they work? You guys remember? What neurotransmitter do they affect? Remember GABA? They help GABA to work better, right? They're help, they bind to a benzodiazepine site. They allow GABA to open up that channel. Remember what flows in through a GABA channel? Not a negative, uh, not a positive ion, but it's a negative one. Major negative ion. Chloride. chloride. Yeah, so chloride flows through, right? Chlorine, chloride will flow through, and that will hyperpolarize those neurons. So it's good if you had someone who's like acutely um, psychotic, if they're having uh, hallucinations, they're very aggressive. These are really good agents to use in addition to the antipsychotics uh, for acute mania episodes. Or they could be used occasionally for those who can't use mood stabilizers. We'll talk about this when we get to the anxiety section a little bit later on. Uh, so just keep in mind that this will come up again. Uh, but we've already covered them a little bit for seizures. Again, we're going to use them as well, um, both either acutely, usually like as in a parenteral form, like IV, something like that, um, or for those kind of acute episodes, or we can use them for more like kind of long-term management. So again, and keep in mind, all these things kind of bleed over. People who have depression also have anxiety issues and may also have bipolar issues. And you see where all these are kind of bleeding over and you have multiple mechanisms, uh, drugs treating multiple facets of the disease, right? So kind of keep that in mind. This is why these patients are so complicated to manage and why it's, you know, people do this as a career, right? Uh, to try to keep these uh, patients kind of at a kind of a stable state there. Anywho. Um, some people may benefit from uh, calcium channel antagonists. I don't see this used too, too often, but it's thought that maybe verapamil, things like nemotapine can be useful for helping to, to regulate um, uh, mood. But again, I would not use these too super commonly, but definitely benzos, definitely antipsychotics. Those are good agents to use for those kind of acute manic episodes. Now, typically for your general treatment strategy, you want to start with a mood stabilizer. Lithium, carbamazepine, valproic acid, um, potentially a second generation antipsychotic. We'll talk more about that later on, but usually valproic acid is a good one that most people are going with nowadays. And then if they're having like insomnia, anxiety, agitation, this is where benzo can be very useful. We'll talk more about this later on, so keep that in the back of your mind. And oxorbazepine may be a backup if one of these mood stabilizers was not working, right? 
for a kind of severe episode, you may need more than one agent. So you know, two agents, rarely three, but usually uh, two are going to be fine for most patients. So keep that in mind. And then if they have an inadequate response, where you can consider using a lithium plus an anticonvulsant or lithium plus a second generation antipsychotic, or uh, potentially you could use uh, anticonvulsant plus another anticonvulsant. So I could use like valproic acid and lamotrigine, um, or I could use like, uh, you know, uh, carbamazepine plus aripiprazole. We'll cover the antipsychotics a little bit later. That's what aripiprazole is. So anywho. So again, the idea is you want to manage their depression, right? So we talked about the depression uh, drugs we'll use for that, and then um, manage the, the the mania episodes. Again, the acute episodes are the difficult ones to treat. That's where they come into the ER. They can be very aggressive, very violent. Uh, I remember there's this one guy who's in the ER. Uh, it was a very interesting case because he was uh, very upset for whatever reason. It was very hard to discern because he was you know kind of speaking a lot of nonsense, um, but he was like. Don't even come at me with the drugs. I'm an atomic bomb. I'm going to go off. He's screaming to the ER. So this is very loud. You know, everyone else is just like, what the heck is going on here? It's like downtown Jacksonville, right? So the whole place is crazy anyway. But this guy was like the king of crazy that night. Um, and so he was just, I'm an atomic bomb. I'm going to go off. I'm going to go off. I'm gonna... And just cursing everywhere and spitting at people. Uh, and eventually, it was, you could tell when he got the drugs, they were able to give him an IM dose of uh, geodon, which is an uh, antipsychotic. And all of a sudden, he's just, and then I'm going to do this. G and then... <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Okay. And then get them in restraints and, and do whatever else they need to do to try to manage him. But again, those, those acute episodes are the, the ones where they can be a danger to themselves or others. That's where like benzos are very good. Uh, those antipsychotics are good to knock them down. So um, we'll talk about those again next week. Any questions I can answer for you on what we've covered so far? All right. If not, uh, I will see you guys next week. And then the test will be the following week. So whatever I can finish up next week, we'll try to do a little bit of review if you guys have questions. So come, some, come back with questions if you have, and we'll answer them then. Okay. Thanks.